if you remember, you, you say your name and you indicate by what authority you sit on the CPC. So let's start. Paul. Uh, Paul Baum, Recreation Commission appointee. Thank you so much. Charles. Charles Phillips, Housing Authority appointee. Thank you. Andrew Boardman. Uh, Andrew Boardman, Planning Board. Thank you, Andrew. John Cratsley. Uh, John Cratsley, Planning Board. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Um, select board. The board. John, I think it's select board, but I, you know. <laughs> no, but it was, it, it, it was the planning. It was the planning board once upon a time. Oh really? Oh that's. Oh so, yes. That's so interesting. <laughs> Sarah. Sarah Grimwood, Natural Resources Commission appointee. Thank you, Nancy Nelson. Nancy Nelson, Historical Commission appointee. Eve. Eve Eisenberg, select board appointee. Thank you, and Burton. Burton Flint Select Board appointee. Thank you. And Diane Proctor Select Board appointee. That means we are a full um, and, and, and robust committee tonight for these important hearings. Um, the, um, the, the first of those hearings um, is on the Bruce Friedman Rail Trail. And uh, John and Charles um, are the ones who are meant to kind of pay attention to this one with, uh, for, j just so that people know that the presenter is Marsha, of course. And, and Marcia, you know well from experience that a, a team usually looks um, at the project and studies its detail and is prepared to ask questions. And then the rest of the committee may, you know, will also chime in with questions if they have them, okay? So, um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, John and Charles, why don't, you, why don't you start this off for us? John Kressel and Charles Phillips. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead, Marcia. Um, I underline several uh, lines in your, your proposal for, for questions. Um, you wrote that there were concerns about safety in Junction Park, and I'm unclear, I guess, what the issue uh, is and what might address the issue. That's question one. Well, I think there are some design elements that we can implement. The concern has been raised by some members of the West Concord Green Thumbs, um, who are the people who maintain that park in such wonderful condition, um, that people who bicycle through the park as part of the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail don't always appear to know where they're going, um, don't always respect uh, others who might be in the park who, who are not getting off their bicycle as they ride through the park. So we're trying to introduce some elements that are decorative as well as uh, strategic that will um, uh, let the cyclists know that they are entering a different space by providing some signage, decorative signage, uh, inviting them to, welcoming them to the park and, and asking them to respect others using the park, uh, to provide uh, some planters that might help visually reduce the, the width of the pavement so that people are not inclined to go so fast. Um, and providing some other signifiers to create entrance experiences, both at Main Street and near the Club Car Cafe. Um, in the terms of planters with uh, trellises and uh, pavement markings outside of the uh, park itself. And um, I do have a brief presentation. So when, when you finished your questions, maybe we could run through that. Marcia, I'm sorry, can we do the presentation first, of course. Oh, okay. Oh, that Would was you... my question. Sorry. <laughs> Lower um, and do you want me to present or are you able to present? You mean the slides? The slides. Yes, I, I can present the slides. Okay. You. Okay. Thank you. Marcia, I'm sorry, you can see my brain isn't entirely. <laughs> um, Diane, I am just, I'm so sorry for your news and I'm, I'm very sympathetic and understanding. So no worries here. <laughs> <Very kind. laughs> so next slide, please. So this, this application has, um, since applying for the, the, um, the grant, I have continue to work with the friends of the, uh, with, with the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail Advisory Committee, the West Concord Green Thumbs, the Commission on Disability. And I made a presentation to the select board recently about these uh, potential um, short-term improvements that would help Junction Park be a better, more welcoming space and a safer space for uh, people entering and exiting through the park. Um, 
may be the time to remind people that there's actually, this is not where the bikes are meant to go. There's yeah, actually- uh, Diane, I'm sorry, that is not true. Yes. I don't know, I don't know oh. who, you talk, who you have talked to, but okay. um, this the plan for Junction Park was developed by former town engineer, Bill Renault. Okay. Back in, in, he started working on this in 2011 um, and continued the work through 2014. He is the one who was able to um, convince the MBTA that we should have a crossing where it is now located next to the platform. And as a result of the change in use for the um, former Mandrioli supermarket to uh, Woods Hill Table, we, we achieved, uh, we, we uh, gained an easement across the back of their property, which connects next to Club Car Cafe to enter into Junction Park. Thank that you. design by the town engineer was handed to the, the design engineer working with me on the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. And we were told the trail is to go through the park. That's why there's a wide path, 13 feet wide, through the park itself. Thank you so much. So, so <laughs> this short term, and then there's a long term solution that if if this short term solution is not workable, um, there will be a there's a proposal that would take it to the next level to separate the pedestrians from the cyclists. But that's that's long term and a, and a more expensive proposal down the road. And we want to see if these short term solutions might might um, manage it better. So, um, so in addition to the uh, Junction Park improvements, we are looking at constructing a, a small path and seating area and interpretive signage that would recognize the Concord Reformatory Cemetery. And we would like to see some sh the same elements that are being proposed for Junction Park used at Neshoba Brook Bridge to help cyclists better understand they should follow the the railroad right of way rather than cross through the commuter parking lot. So the next slide, please. Hmm. Um, don't know if you can see this very well, <laughs> but uh, the, the elements that we be adding to Junction Park are some signage to welcome people and, and, and advising them to use caution and respect others using the park, installing planters, um, installing planters with screens to actually screen the commuter rail um, platform and parking area from the park as people are moving through the park from a south to a north direction, um, adding some planters to define the edges and to add a colorful border. Next slide, please. So these are the elements that were presented to the select board on October 3rd, and I'm pursuing um, uh, purchase of them over the winter with installation anticipated in the spring before the, the bridge over Route 2 is, is officially opened for the public to use. So the, um, these are the, the planters. That's an existing planter. We will mimic those same planters. The sign um, would provide that information about welcoming to Junction Park. Um, the pa These pavement markings are not necessarily what needs, what might be designed, but we would work with an artist in West Concord who could help us come up with a design. And then the screen, um, I have to have reviewed by the MBTA and make sure that they are okay with this approach. But I think um, from initial conversations, they were at least open to that. So these, the design that I've, I've outlined for you uh, has been estimated at $28,000 but there's only $15,000 currently available from FY22 CPA funds that were appropriated this year. So I, I would need some additional funding. Next slide, please. Now, these are the, the, the views of the Concord Reformatory Cemetery um, and where the fence currently ends would take a path into that area and a small seating area at the base of that tree that's been um, it had to be trimmed back severely, uh, but it is a love, it, I don't have the whole tree, but the, the, the oak itself is just a fabulous um, specimen tree. Um, there are, oh, we've been working with Concord Prison Outreach and the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail Advisory Committee to, to 
create an interpretive uh, and a contemplative space that uh, will invite people and, and tell the story of those who are buried here. Um, they are their gravestones are simply numbered. Uh, and so there have been efforts to name the unnamed. And we want to share that information and, and really create um, a history here. So my next slide, please. Um, so the estimate for Junction Park is an additional $13,000 needed. We're anticipating um, 10,000 plus additional fundraising by others is needed for the construction of the reformatory cemetery project. And the estimate for Neshoba Brook Bridge is about $27,000, which brings us up to the $50,000 request. So that's my quick presentation. Thank you. A huge help, Marcia. Thank you okay. so much. If we could stop showing that screen, yeah. that would be terrific. Thank you. Oh. Now, John, yeah. back to you. <laughs> Additional I questions. think, Marcia, that's been extremely helpful. And my, mm -hmm. my, because my other, really, my, other question was about the mix of old and new funds, which yeah. you've explained. Um, I wasn't clear what in the Neshoba Brook Bridge is a, a twenty-seven thousand. Um, is that by uh, YC? Is that signage fencing? It and, would be. It would be the same thing. The, the a planters um, signage and fencing, uh, as well as some pavement markings that would help cyclists and users better. Um, follow the path rather than go straight through to the through the commuter parking lot right now. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Charles, do you have some questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, one, okay, I guess you've answered um, the, the, the diagram was quite clear of what you're going to do. And, and it's interesting to, to look at the, the next phase of the plan, you know, and how, how, how to remove that, the, the path over. Um, and I guess the, the only thing I have to ask is, uh, are the planters going to be movable? Yes, the planters are intended to be movable. They will be removed entirely for the winter season to allow for the plowing of the park itself. Uh, they're lightweight. Uh, they will be self-watering and we'll probably just be planting them with grasses so they'll be low maintenance. Um, I, I don't have the... the um, off, uh, let me see the the agreement of the green thumbs that they would be willing to maintain the planters themselves, yeah. but um, we want to make sure that whatever is in there is easy to maintain, but creates that that visual um, cue for people to to slow down uh, and as and to be a pleasant experience as they do so. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, that, that my other question was who, whether whether the the um, garden club is willing to put flowers in there and, and, you have, and um, um i'm willing to pay for the plants um, okay, well, <laughs> and i have i want to continue to work with the, the green thumbs to identify what plants would be most appropriate and i'll also explore with them if they're uh, their willingness to maintain that if not we will probably work with the um minuteman arc folks to make sure that they're at least watered and i think if it's grasses it would be fairly easy to maintain that way That's okay Nancy, no. and then um, I, I had a somewhat related question. Um, some of the, um, the barriers and screens look more or less fragile and um, portable, like the obelisk, the little obelisk, which I love, but aren't they the kind you could just pick up and move? <laughs> and some of them look much more durable and resistant to um, walking away. Well, the, again, these are um, short-term elements to see if it works. Uh, oh. I think, I think uh, once we, the the beauty of having things that are movable and and easy to install and low cost gives us that opportunity to check out and tr try some different elements. If if those vertical elements are uh, seem to work really well, I'll probably be back to look. You know, maybe we can do an arch. Maybe we can do something longer term. the The trellises are seven feet tall. They'll be in the planters. So um, hopefully, uh, the, the green thumbs we're talking about a um, couple of uh, wonderful um, binding like <laughs> plants, and I, I can't remember the names of all the different ones, but. Uh, so. But it's those little iron obelisk things that are very, very precious and desirable. In other <laughs> <parts>. <laughs> okay. 
just point taken. I, I'll make sure I, that they're I, secured. I <laughs> um, um, good luck with this. I think um, it's an important thing to try to make those distinctions between different users. I remember um, being on the historical commission with a person who said, well, they have to change the paving because it's not very good for bikes. <laughs> so, so this is an old, old uh, challenge, I guess. Yeah, it's so interesting, Nancy, because that is a constant dialogue right now in the town, isn't that? Yeah. Isn't that the, the biker versus the, and I don't think of bikers as boom, boom, I mean. <laughs> and, 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 and the citizens, you know, perhaps walking or strolling. <laughs> um, Paul. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Marsha. If, you, if you'll allow me, I'd just like to ask a question sort of a little bit beyond the application. The uh, the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail and the development, it's just been tremendous success in town. I think the CPC has been so pleased to be part of that. Now that the trail is almost complete from Sudbury Line to Acton, what comes next other than kind of, you know, tweaking things like we talked about here? It's more than tweaking, important things. What comes next? What what comes next in terms of what? <laughs> I well, mean, you know, I, I'm thinking. Well, is the trail kind of complete? Is it just now enhancements? I'm thinking a little, little bit about you know future funding for, from CPC and other funds. What, in, what's, in Concord, you know, in Concord, it would probably just be small enhancements down the road. Um, the construction for two B is anticipated to be well. It, it was anticipated to be completed in July of this year, um, but was delayed and is now hoped for the end of November. That may be further delayed. I'm, um, I've, I will find out more this Friday when we have an update meeting with MassDOT. Um, the last phase, the last half mile in Concord is part of the construction project that will be uh, beginning in, in Sudbury, probably in the spring. That contract was bid this past fall and uh, they're working out the con contractual obligations of the contractor. Um, so that will start, if not later this fall, in, in the early spring and is expected to be completed in two years. Uh, Sudbury has continued to, um, its work, I think they acquired a C former CSX um, property that they are currently designing and that will take it to the, um, Framingham border and a, and I believe the town of Framingham no is it Framingham uh, yeah, um, Framingham. Yeah. okay thank you so uh, and then Framingham is in the process of acquiring the CSX project so um, the ultimate design will be 25 miles from Lowell to Framingham and back wow so a robust workout <laughs> it will be <laughs> <laughs> For those willing to undertake yeah. it, that's fantastic. Um, do other? Oh, Eve. I had a question for um, two seconds, Sandra, and Eve sure. has end up. Go ahead, Eve. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just no, I have a I have a quick question for you, Marsha, um, because I'm fascinated with this. What you're working on, especially around Junction Park, and um, I loved your pictures of the example um, example pavements or or markings on the pavement. I'm just I'm wondering if you have uh, precedence for these elsewhere on the trail, maybe in other towns or on a different trail that you're looking at to come to compare success with after you've set up what you want to set up. Uh, I, I'm not aware of other trails where this has been used, but I know that it is being used extensively for crosswalks and sidewalks um, in other locations around the Commonwealth, um, particularly in and around Boston. And while we excuse me, we've been working with the West Concord Junction Cultural District to see if we could add these kinds of elements to the pavement. There's been some hesitancy on the part of um, town staff, uh, public work staff, because of their concerns with um, maintaining it, making sure that it's not slippery, so uh, that, that, that it uh, and um, what happens if it be, is vandalized and, and how it is handled over a year um, or over the course of a year. Um, my I anticipate that this will be updated every year, that we would need a new artist to come in and, and paint it over again. But it's um, it's intended to be like a, a welcome mat or, um, a, you know, just to identify, to signify a change in your, you're entering a different space. And I think I'm hopeful that that will work out. Um, so we'll find out. 
Good luck with your wayfinding. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. Yes, Andrew. Um, and so my Andrew, question had to do Andrew, with the use of. How do you um, see raise your hand uh, device on the on the computer? Sure. There's, there's a little place where you can just indicate. I'll, I'll show you. Raise your hand, and then you lower your hand, and that way we we go in order. Okay. Okay. Your turn. Go ahead. Sure. Um, my my question had to do um, in, in part with the pain, um, where. My understanding is that Junction Park was designed to be a permeable surface. So no. are they going to paint each brick separately? No. Or are they just going to, no. like, what's the, Good question. Will, okay. will it impact the original plan to have? No, a um, this is not intended to be on the bricks themselves. This is outside of the park itself. So it would be on the concrete sidewalk at Main Street and on the asphalt pavement next to Club Car Cafe where the trail begins to enter the park. So none okay. of the bricks would be covered because that's a, a, um, a pervious paver and is intended to allow stormwater to enter into right. uh, and, and flow into the groundwater. Okay, so it would be like on the sidewalk and on the street is the idea? Well, it's the sidewalk and the bike path. On the other side of the road? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, well, no, no. The bike path uh, next to Club Car Cafe. That's. I, I'm just street. talking about. I'm. I'm just thinking of the where it crosses Commonwealth Avenue and immediately oh, transitions from sidewalk onto those permeable pavements. It will just be on the sidewalk itself. Okay. And then my other question was the location. The idea is is that the the planters and stuff would come out in front of the bollards to try to make it more. Because right now there are existing. There's three large granite pillars stopping okay. me from going straight through a car. So from, from Main Street? Be, yeah, from, from Main, Main Street. Street. The thought they would come out further? No, no there are, um, the, the pavement uh, flares <clears throat> a little bit where the old park meets the, the extension of the park. And it, those planters would be located in those little flares. So it would define the edges of the pavement. Okay, so it's just tightening up the pavement. Yeah. Um, and then was there, there was no thought to actually using paint and such on the, the part of the bridge, was there? Um, the, or, the, the Neshoba Brook Bridge? No, yeah. no paint would be okay. used on the bridge because that's uh, primarily pavers. There, are, there is asphalt for this, the trail itself, but we're trying to clearly define, you know, you go in, in to the right rather than going straight through. Um, okay. Because one of the things that... Um, Another element that is from a prior year um, request, I think it's 2020, is to create a, a handicapped accessible ramp from the bicycle parking area to the trail itself. That is included as part of the um, public works project for improvements to Commonwealth Ave as a, an add-on. Um, that work is uh, wasn't completed this year. Um, they, they had to extend it and it's going to be done next year. So those funds are being, the funds from 2020, which I believe is about $25,000, um, the major portion of those funds are going toward the installation of that handicapped accessible ramp. And so people will, will visually see a ramp and they'll think, oh, I can go straight. So we're trying to um, add planters or screens to clearly indicate that you need to go to the right and, and follow it in this direction. You know what the undertaking is 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 so important and so interesting and it's clearly experimental in some ways. So my question, Marcia, is who uh, you know Bush described himself W as as the decider. Do we all remember when he said I'm going to be the decider? Who is the, who is the decider here? Who decides whether this these these visual um, encouragements um, others will call them impediments, but these you know these 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 visual um, efforts to try to get people to slow down at this one part, walk their bike through or, or pedal very slowly. Um, who's going to decide? Will one slight accident or um, in, uh, irate or disappointed citizens sitting in the park be the determiner? I mean, how has, have we thought about that in advance so that people can anticipate and know how best to try to adjudicate the effectiveness? Nope. Um, well, I know the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail Advisory Committee is is primarily focused on on gathering the information and making oh, okay. sure that whatever is working. And then I've also 
um, made a request for a capital improvement project of $75,000 for FY25, uh, so a couple years into the future, to that would allow for an engineer consultant designer to evaluate the effectiveness of what's in place and, and help the, uh, the advisory committee or another group make the decision as to whether we need to implement the long-term solution or not. There are sufficient funds in that $75,000 that would allow for that designer to then go to the next level or next phase. So um, we have two, two aspects. One would be um, uh, the boots on the ground, residents and the advisory committee members and then uh, down the road it will be a, an official um, engineering consultant to assist them thank you marcia that's that is terrific um i urge you as i'm sure you know well to get as much detail into the actual proposal going forward um, as we can so that the so town citizens when they're observing this or looking at it can see some of the 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 visual presentations you you've offered and can also um, you know, be able to bring a, a kind of tangible imagination to the work you're doing and the work you're, you're conceiving. Um, and and I, I know, you, I know you, you've got plenty of time to do it, but I think that's kind of important. Well, I, I, I would like to give a shout out to uh, Jennifer Brooke, who, was, uh, who is a member of the uh, Commission on Disability and is also a landscape architect. She uh, met me out in the field to to talk through the design and came up and we discussed all these different elements and then provided some guidance in that. So um, as I said, it's it's been vetted by the advisory the Bruce Fruin Rail Trail Advisory Committee, the uh, West Concord Green Thumbs, the D Commission on Disability. I've taken this to the West Concord Advisory Committee uh, and the West Concord Junction Cultural District. So the different groups who have an interest in West Concord have at least had a chance to see what is being proposed. And, and I haven't heard any strong, you know, no no way Jose <laughs> comments. And, and Public Works has also weighed in on this. So uh, since they are the ones who are responsible for maintaining the park itself a lot um, in terms of snow removal and all. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, this is terrific. Do, do you ever hear anything from the businesses in the area um, as to their feelings about this? Um, Feelings uh, about the park uh, or the trail about, trail or what? Either about the park or the changes that you're making. I mean, is, it, is, it, is approval expressed? Is appreciation expressed? Or is worry expressed? Uh, I would have to say none of the, the above because I haven't really gone door to door to the uh, the businesses. Um, I suppose you know I should bring it up with the Economic Vitality Committee or I could also bring it up with the Chamber of Commerce um, mm -hmm. as possibilities. Okay, thank you so much. That's terrific. Thank you, Marcia. You're amazing. Okay. okay. Um, the next is the Regional um, Housing Services Office. And Marcia, you get to present this too. I gather Liz Ross cannot be here tonight. Um, I talked with her earlier today. Okay. And I, know she's, I know she's not going to be able to be here this evening. So, All right. Well, I have another short presentation, um, if Anne could uh, put that up. That would be great. Uh, it's also on on your web page, so that was it was yes. put up today. So um, our annual request for the Regional Housing Services Office. Next slide, please. And many of you know that the RHSO was created in 2011. Concord continues to serve as the lead community, um, and that is through an agreement with all of the town managers that are served by the RHSO, and it's now nine communities. And the RHSO offices are located at 37 Knox Trail, which is a town building, but located in the town of Acton. And it's it's very convenient for the, the communities that are participants. Next slide. So um, the standard things that uh, the RHSO provides are the monitoring our home ownership and rental units, our subsidized housing inventory administration. So anytime a new unit comes on board, they help get that added to our SHI listing. The home administration, um, that is a little more challenging. Uh, one of the uh, recommendations of the 20, 2005 rather long range plan was that, uh, and several of the um, housing production plans prior to 2010 recommended that Concord become a member of the West Metro Home Consortium that would uh, give us access to some HUD 
housing funding. Can you so, what um, the acronym is H O M E. Ah, you I, you would ask, and I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm so sorry, um, but I will provide that to you. Um, this consortium of communities uh, gets federal funds, and it's allocated to each community individually. Um, if you do not have a project that is ready to go forward, we pool our resources and then uh, projects that are, are shovel ready in various communities can uh, um, request some additional funding. So these home funds have been useful in the Peter Bulkley uh, renovations uh, where we converted that, that single room occupancy uh, housing to uh, rental units, uh, you know, single room rental units. It was it was really a pl plus, um, and they we've been able to access other um, provide other projects. So Concord has benefited from that home participation. Um, we also the RHSO provides local support for our nonprofit groups as well as the new Concord Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. And the resale of existable affordable units, uh, residence assistance, and regional activities support. Next slide, please. So this year, um, we are requesting 33,000, uh, 28,000 to match the town's contribution, plus $5,000 for the added support of the Concord Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. Um, some of the highlights of the RHS work this past year has been to assist the town and CHDC with the Assabet River Bluff project. Thank you very much, CPC. Um, we, they've continued work on our housing production plan and have prepared a needs assessment, which will be reviewed by our steering committee this uh, tomorrow night. And um, we're hoping that that plan will be completed by the end of this year. And then they've uh, they've been assisting with the Christopher Heights at Junction Village uh, in support of the town and the CHDC on project status, as well as the open space efforts that were going on uh, a year ago. Next slide. So uh, as I said, the we're seeking thirty three thousand dollars, which would be the twenty eight thousand plus five thousand. Um, this will leverage town funds for the additional 28,000 and then additional support is provided from the Concord Housing Development Corporation in the amount of $4,000. So our, the budget for the RHSO this year is $65,000 total. Uh, Concord uh, Housing Authority um, will provide additional funds if and when additional services are needed from the RHSO. Uh, they've been able to, they were able to assist with a recent um, uh, conversion of some federal housing to uh, ownership by this Concord Housing Authority. So that was one of the projects that happened last year. Next slide. And I think that's it. So thank you, Marcia, so much. Um, uh, this, this is mine to kind of cover. And I have a question on the second page of the uh, regional housing services portion of the application. Uh, which is, uh, it begins with the Regional Housing Service Office, and then you turn it to the second page of that. And it shows that Concord lost eight units, mm -hmm. uh, one at Forest Ridge and nine at DDS units. It, of course, anticipated Junction Village, which it no longer can, um, and then hopes to pick up um, on Main Street and at Mill Run. Why did we lose um, units at Forest Ridge? Do you know? Not entirely. Um, may have been um, that. Oh, that that one. I'm I'm not clear on. Okay. Well, it, I'm I'm just very curious because I mean, practice, we need to count. We, we need everything we can <laughs> we can count. And I was true. true. I was, I was really rather surprised that that you know that 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 was there. And what are the DDS units minus nine? Um, well, that's those are um, those are units that the town does not know um, where they're located or how they are are created. They're um, usually group homes of some kind, and it's the Department of Development. What was formerly the Department of Developmental Services. Um, they now have a different acronym. I think it's the Division of Children and Families um, oh, okay. creates these homes. So uh, mainly group homes, or they might be um, 
some kind of shared housing. And um, we are finding that communities similar to Concord, such as Lexington um, and others, are losing these types of homes. I think that there are some challenges in maintaining them uh, in communities. They are uh, they are identified through DDS um, and through the state. And so the town has no idea where they're located or what their addresses are. Uh, and we have no control over whether they're you know how they're counted or whether they're they're in existence in Concord. And it's the state that notifies us when they are no longer in existence as a part of housing. Okay. Well, I noticed that it was it was it was the same in many of the towns. Yeah. DDS units were being lost, but I I couldn't quite discern kind of what DDS units were. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, when do we receive our um, our, our senses. Do you, do you know exactly now? I, I don't know exactly, but there are, the prediction is that we shall hear uh, the the 2020 census numbers, the final numbers, and our uh, the change in our subsidized housing inventory requirement in May of 2023. Uh, no later than that. All right. Well, I've been saying that, but but so that really seems pretty clear to you that that's when it's going to happen, right? That's. Well, yeah. You're hearing the same thing I'm hearing. Yeah, so. okay. yeah, we're, either talk, we're either whispering in each other's ear or there's actually <laughs> an authentic reason to believe that. Um, thank you. Uh, we are blessed to have Liz Russ and blessed to have the people working in this whole project um, so very, very much. And I see we have some other questions. So Sarah, would you like to start and then go to Charles, please? Yeah, I, I'm Diane. Actually, I just wanted to respond to your question about Forest Ridge. The way I read this is that there was a gain at Forest Ridge. It's actually, I, I, that's not how I saw it. So let me oh, look again. Yes, it, okay, <laughs> that I can answer. <laughs> it said minus eight. Oh, well, it's minus eight in total. Ah, which was, minus nine plus one is minus eight. Yes. Ah, thank you, Sarah. Um, that was a recent, that was a resale that we were able to buy down and then create a subsidized housing unit for. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Charles. So that was the same thing I was going to say. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Are there other questions besides plaudits for all the incredible work that this organization does for our town? John. What is the, the number of employees in the office? Um, currently, currently there are four. We are in the process of recruiting a fifth person. And that's all carried by this modest budget. Well, it's one. We're one of nine communities. Each community contributes toward the RHSO, uh, and it's based on the numbers of affordable housing units that are in each community. We can also contract for additional services on, on, on occasion. So, some communities, um, such as Acton, during the the um, pandemic had a rental assistance program. And so their funding, um, their, their program actually went more toward that um, rental assistance program than other things that they might've been working on. So each community can decide how and what services they wish to um, use from the, the RHSO. There are some common things that we pay for, such as the website and the, the rental of equipment and, and supplying the, the um, office space itself. But other than that, um, it's uh, each community pays for those services that they receive. Marcia, that's so interesting. So that leads to a fascinating question. Could the RHSO use resources that the town has, our Concord has, um, to uh, simply look at what affordable housing is out there under you know support the, the rental cost and thereby increase the number of affordable housing units in the town more dramatically than it might be able to do otherwise. I'm not sure I'm following that question. Well, let's say that, the, that, that I noticed the other day, for instance, there was a, a, a house um, for rental for 2000 something a month. That lots of families, affordable housing families would not be able to spend that much money um, for, could the, for, could, the Concord Housing um, <clears throat> Program simply say, okay, we're gonna use this money to reduce that 
to a thousand dollars a month. Um, during the pandemic, we we looked at that issue and and talked with both the Council on Aging and our Human Services offices, and um, they were basic and as well as a couple of <laughs> of other groups, and they were basically okay. saying that there wasn't the same need that there is in other communities, so we did not pursue it as a as, as a program. So I. Uh, we can certainly explore that and maybe through our housing production plan and begin to answer that question, but it was not identified as a high need during the pandemic, unlike other communities. And could it only be, um, it, it was this only something that could be extended during the pandemic? Or no, it- I think we, I think we could have such a program. The, 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 the issue is giving money to uh, renters uh, similar to home ownership units, we can we can buy down units for mm-hmm. home ownership, but we can't necessarily give money to um, the person buying the house. So you can help you can help subsidize the the buyout <laughs> or, or pay down to the the homeowner, but yeah. we can't provide money. It's very complicated. Um, I was wondering, yeah, how, how, how complicated is it? It's very. <laughs> well, thank you. These are all, this is such interesting questions. Yeah, John, do you have other questions? Then? Well, John? I was trying to figure out, yeah, I was trying to figure out Liz Russ's role. Is she one of the five or four? Yes. She is yeah. the director or, or uh-huh. she provides the oversight for all of it. Yes. In case you wonder, this is my iced tea, which I so often have in hand. <laughs> so this is not Johnny Carson <laughs> drinking. <laughs> if it were, I'd probably have it in a, in a coffee cup. Andrew. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I wasn't as familiar with this until this year. So I, I dug a little deeper and was just uh, poking around the other towns that are part of the consortium and noticed that um, Acton goes ahead and funds it for two years at a time. Have you thought of trying that just to make yourself have a few less applications? Because it seems like if your your plan is to continually do this every year, would it make sense to consider a little bit of forward planning and, and do it that way? I don't know from a budgeting perspective what that does, but I was just yeah. throwing it out there. That's a really good idea, uh, a point. Um, because I think in the case of Acton, they receive 100% from their community preservation committee, whereas the town ma- it matches nor- most of the time, not this particular year, but uh, we've been trying to keep it at a 50-50 match. And so a lot depends on budgeting um, what's going on at the town. So I have not thought about going more frequently, but I might just do that, make that recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> um, terrific. Are there other questions? Andrew, what a good question. Thank you. Other questions? Marcia, thank you so much. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Go and enjoy your family. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just hang out and listen oh, to the good. others. <laughs> hang out. We love it. Okay. Um, the, the, next, the next project, and I see Delia is with us. Hello. Good evening, Delia. We're glad to have you here. And let's see. Wait till she's not having her dinner, Nancy. We'll see if she's <laughs> see if she's with us. Um, there she is. Hello, Hi, I'm sorry, my cat was just screaming to come in. Ah, uh, ah, uh, you know the the wonderful the wonderful the, the wonderful people the wonderful beasts with whom we share our world, right? <laughs> it was upon our attention. Um, this is the Natural Resources Division um, uh, application about Warner's Pond. Oh, no, this is the Open Space and Recreation Plan update. Uh, and you'll come back later on the Warner's Pond. Uh, I'm sure you have a presentation. Can you take us through it? Thank you. Gary, if we're talking, we can't hear you, so. Can other people hear her? Because I cannot. Hold on. Okay. I didn't you send this to Anne ahead of time? Is this Anne running the slideshow? Okay. Hi, Anne. How's it going? <laughs> Are you? 
I, I, I do have I have the slideshow, but Delia was the one sharing the screen. Ah. I'm not sure what's going on with the sound. But she's unmuted and her video is on. Uh, Delia is actually muted right oh, now. now she's Delia, muted. You muted and then talked. So I. Oh, Thank no, we can't hear you now. Sorry. That's weird. Oh, no, she's unmuted again. Ah, uh, now you're unmuted. Fantastic. Yeah, you're, now you're unmuted, so that's good. No, we can't hear you. No. you want to say hello or good evening? Do you have a she's, volume? I think she's double volume? muted. Yeah, do you have your volume control on your computer that you can adjust? Because it was a little, um, little less than robust when you first spoke. So, should be okay. Hear me now? Yes. Can you get yeah. it up a little higher? Well, we could turn up our volume too. Hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. okay. I'm so sorry. I, I I think that I need to get a new computer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, sorry about that. Um, so <clears throat> this request is for one hundred thousand uh, dollars from CPA funding, um, both from the open space and recreation accounts um, for the town's update of the open space and recreation plan. Um, let me go to the next screen. If I can manage that, I'm so sorry. Um, okay. Oh, where was that photo, Delia? It's lovely. That is um, an Ed Grabhorn photo of um, beautiful. I've lost it. Here it is. It is the. Um, um almost looks like watercolor like one of his paintings it is one of his paintings it is the cover of our current open yeah. space and recreation oh, plan I'm, i thought oh. it was a photo he did yeah it looks like a watercolor it's beautiful it is it's a yeah, it's a painting beautiful. yep it's a watercolor um so let me go to um just getting this back into um the slideshow uh, so there's grab horn there. Okay, oh, yeah. so the open space and recreation plan, we have had one in Concord since at least the 1980s and probably earlier, but that's the earliest oh. that I can find. Um, the open space and recreation plan provides a roadmap so that we evaluate all of our existing conditions, what lands we have acquired, both for conservation as well as for recreation purposes. And we look at these and we work with the community to decide how we want to move forward with acquisitions in the future. Um, and also we look at how we want to steward our current um, lands. And we are very fortunate in Concord that we have people who are very interested. We usually have a very robust um, public input component. Uh, we did find when we did the last update in 2013-14, it was published in 2015, that we did not have enough, um, we did a lot of in-house um, work to evaluate a lot of what we wanted to gather uh, from the community. And so this request is, for $100,000 for a consultant to help us with the plan development. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, the uh, most recent um, comprehensive uh, plan, um, the Envision Concord was, uh, the consultant was $160,000. I don't think it needs to be that much but we are requesting um, funding to allow us to really gather that robust community input, develop good maps, and help us provide this roadmap 
um, for the for the future. These plans are only valid for seven years, but they do allow us to be eligible for certain state and federal grants um, within the seven years that we had our active plan. We were able to realize nine hundred thousand dollars in federal and state grants uh 2016 the above photo is of um october farm riverfront which was a state land grant for four hundred thousand dollars and in this year we received a federal land and water conservation fund grant for five hundred thousand dollars towards the um Assabet river bluff preservation project and mm -hmm. I'm going to leave it at that and open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Delia. Um, Eve and I are the ones who are looking at this one in particular. So if you could not share any longer, we'll all come back together. Oh, yes. Sorry. Okay. That's all right. So Eve, you want to you want you want to start with what is sure. Yeah. Um, I just uh, I'm fairly new to all of this, and so I apologize if this is questions born of ignorance, but um, I was just curious about what what are the state approval requirements that the consultant help, consultant helps you with? And and then secondly, um, what did we learn? You started to answer it. You started to speak to this in your presentation, but what did we learn from the 2014 plan? It's like 250 pages long, and that's why I was late. I was busy trying to understand it. Um, what would you do differently this time? So I'm going to answer the second part of that question first. What I would do differently this time is we have the Concord Envision Plan, we have the MVP, we have the Climate Action Plan, we have a lot of plans that we want to be sure do not live on a shelf. Um, we're currently working on a hazards mitigation plan update with FEMA and MAPC. So one of my goals is to take all of the relevant current plans, including the 2015 Open Space and Rec Recreation Plan update, and bring those, just marry those together to sort of bring that to the community and say, this is what we have identified, or these are the priorities that we have identified. How do we see ourselves moving forward? As part of the, there's an action plan within the 2015 um, OSRP update, and it lists out all these things that we should be doing and targets that we're trying to get towards. One of the requirements mm -hmm. is that we update that plan um, for the state and demonstrate that we are actually accomplishing the goals that we have laid out. But I think those goals change. Like our last plan did not in my opinion, and I was here, I was, you know, it was my plan. <laughs> I, it, not my plan, but, you know, I was shepherding this plan. It did not sufficiently address climate change. So that's something that we need to really be looking at. I mean, we're not a coastal community, but we've got all kinds of infrastructure. We've got all kinds of resources that can be impacted by climate change. So, so those are, um, a few things that I hope answer that question. Um, let me know if. Well, I, I did notice at the end of the the update that all of the the list of act fifteen action items in their progress from the the year before or the sorry the version before rather, and I I wasn't sure actually how much pro progress had been made um, by by what was written and not knowing anything of course. Um, and so I imagine that that is probably the one of the answers to my first question that the state requires you to to analyze the action plan and come up with an answer. And I realize that that's sort of just you know state requirements. I was wondering what other requirements uh, we have because as you mentioned, there are a lot of plans floating around, and we don't want to we want them to get all the action items together and prioritize them. I love that. Um, so I just don't know how this fits in. It's a lot. It is a lot. Um, so there is a an open space space and recreation plan workbook that really prescribes how these plans should be written. Mm -hmm. And plus and minus, 
the state does not get involved until you submit a draft plan to them. And it mm -hmm. takes about a year to complete mm -hmm. um, with all of the, you know, public outreach and the writing and the map updates. You know, we've got probably a hundred more acres of conservation lands than we had from the last plan. Um, there's been a significant number of changes. Um, we go through and we say how we've addressed and the, the, the action plan of goals is pages long. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we look at all these things and then we say what now is a priority. Um, but the state, unfortunately, doesn't really get involved until you submit your plan to them. And they say, okay, this meets our, our requirements or yes, you know, they, they will always ask for <laughs> additional information and there's some good dialogue between them. Um, but it is um, a little bit of an unknown in terms of what the state is looking for. Um, but we have this good um, work plan that the state has developed. It's a several page document that's available on their website. I'm happy to share that. Mm -hmm. um, that really provides communities with that roadmap. And everybody does it differently. You know, we would, as most communities do, we would establish an open space and recreation plan uh, task force to really work on this plan, sort of a subgroup of the Natural Resources Commission. Um, it's, a, it is, it's a lot of work. Um, some of you, I think, have been involved in the Envision Concord. Um, <laughs> And it is, it's, you know, it's not insubstantial, the amount of thought um, and writing and map development and public outreach that goes into it. Thank you. You're welcome. Eve, do you have other questions? Because I, I do. I, I mean, again, this is probably born of ignorance, but we, I was lucky to be able to are, talk. Questions are really important because they inform everybody. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, as a member of the general public, then <laughs> um, uh, we I was able to um, read a little bit about the historic preservation plan that's coming down the pipeline as well. And there there is a movement af uh, afoot to make that interactive somehow using technology. Um, and I was just wondering, is there any any thoughts to have the open space plan or any of these other plans that you're working on be more available to the general public for you know, GIS reasons, or where can I walk my dog reasons, or, you know, that that it's more accessible than something you have to search for in the town website and then download a 250 page document. And not not <laughs> that that's, I think bad that's a great thing, question. Um, I was talking with somebody from the town of Wellesley. They are in the midst. They have their plan for approval at the state. <laughs> and they mentioned a program that I've never heard of called Slido, S-L-I-D-O, and somebody can educate me on that. I don't know anything about it, but the way that he explained it was that it was a very interactive tool um, that helps them with their public outreach. I don't know whether that would help in terms of, you know, we're always looking for ways to educate people on, you know, <sighs> We have these ways of disseminating information. I just was talking to somebody, to somebody about this not even a week ago, but it's never enough because everybody receives information differently. So this Slido tool might be a way to do that. I don't know, um, but it's something that I wrote down in the notes that I took <laughs> on this. And it's something that we, we would evaluate as part, of the, as part of the update. Thank you. That's it for me, Diane. Okay, thank you. I, I have some, some equally ignorant questions. <laughs> so I, none, none of these are, these are all great questions. And, and so my, my first question really is, is about the, the, the word um, recreation plan, Delia. Do you work with recreation commission when you're doing the, the recreation plan? And what is the relationship between the recreation commission and the work that you're undertaking? Great question. So um, we work very closely with the Recreation Commission on this open space and recreation plan development. Okay. Um, but we have truthfully limited engagement with recreation outside of that. 
Um, and I think there's a, you know, there's an understandable reason for that. The recreation department deals with active recreation. So built structures, playgrounds, um, you know, um, pools, parks. playing fields, parks, those sorts of things. And, and natural resources works with passive recreation. So unpaved, no structures, you know, walks in nature, um, very, very, very limited infrastructure. You know, we've got uh, kiosks and benches and, you know, these sorts of things. Um, so, you know, but, but when we do this plan, somebody from the Recreation Commission is part of the task force. And that has always been the case. That's terrific because last year we granted a rather robust yes. sum to them to do a study. And, right. and, and d d distinguishing the differentiation between the study you're doing and the study they're doing, it seemed to me was not kind of unimportant. And I have another question, um, and that is open space. Uh, there is a, a need for open space in our town for many reasons, and some of it may be to be able to build affordable housing. And the CPC has been dealing with this, as you know, in the Assabet River Bluff project and in other areas where we were able to use some of our affordable house, some of our open space areas really for affordable housing. Um, how much of the, uh, of the dialogue and the study that's going forward uh, in this plan would look at where it might be appropriate, prudent, uh, reasonable uh, to, to, to offer some of this open space for affordable housing. And is that, um, do you see that as under your aegis at all? Do you see working with uh, the various housing departments as part of the long range planning? Um, so I would say, I, I, I feel so honored. I'm so glad Lee is on this call, Lee Smith. Um, he and I worked with Marsha and Liz Rust and the Land Trust, Polly Reeve and- um, And us. Christy Collins. <laughs> Every, right. I mean, this humongous community effort to have this joint um, goal of community housing and open space preservation realized. Yes, so I think there's, you know, real potential and ability to see that accomplished. Um, the goal of the open space and recreation plan is not to identify affordable housing lands. We do have um, mechanisms in place where, um, you know, when a land, a parcel comes up for acquisition, we are in contact with housing groups to see, does it make sense? Can we find a joint purpose here? Does it make more sense that you are the owners of this land? Does it make more sense that it goes to conservation? So those conversations are already occurring, but it's not, that's not part of the open space and recreation plan. The open space and recreation plan is designed to identify lands that are valuable for our article 97 preservation which is the you know watershed protection recreation and conservation lands thank you that uh, it, it it might be not imprudent over time for for there to be um just an eye cast in that direction <laughs> um, yeah I mean, that that's, I think, mandate, but I mean, I just, yeah, remit. right. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, it's a state mandated. Yeah, I know. Um, but I, I think that's right. And I think the state is sort of cobbling together and, you know, sometimes <laughs> well, and sometimes poorly ways to look at affordable housing. Um, it's certainly something that I think Concord has been really good about, um, looking at and trying to understand it's it is harder i think as everybody on this call knows it's a lot more difficult to raise money for community housing than it is for open space purposes whether Absolutely. it's recreation or conservation thank you so much i see paul has his hand up and nancy so paul you want to start yeah hi good evening delia um a couple of comments meant to be helpful rather critical but they may sound critical um, on face value, it was very difficult to evaluate 
your application, but the richness that you provide in this conversation adds a lot of detail. And I think a lot of detail, that detail should be in the application. For example, the exact scope of work that the consultant is going to do. I think mean, there's very, very little in the application about exactly what the consultant's going to do. It basically says $100,000 for a consultant. So, I mean, the scope of work, the schedule, um, the coordination activities that you've talked about here with other departments, the task force that you plan to set up, um, the schedule, the scope of work. I, I think all those are important because uh, beyond the CPC, the community is going to be looking at the application as well. And I think you've thought about a lot of this, but it's not in the application. I think it, that richness would benefit and would probably better justify the, sort of the, um, the, the funding. So that, that's sort of a general commentary. I mean, a lot of that details, you've provided that here. Um, on the plan itself, the existing plan is... It's very detailed and it's very rich and it's very map, map oriented. Do you see the new plan as a complete um, revision or an update? Because there's a lot of material there to work with. Um, you mentioned climate change. Certainly there's some things that are missing. Do you view the new plan as um, as a 20% as a addition or a completely new document? How do you view the new plan? <laughs> Uh, so that last plan, the 2015 plan is an update. Yeah. Yes. So I envision what we will be producing is something along those lines. It's not going to be a 10 page document. It will be a new 200 plus document um, update. It, it, you know, looks at what additional lands have been acquired for recreation and conservation. It addresses now what the community's priorities are, um, and the maps are all different. Um, so it is going to be another, you know, 200 page document. Um, I'm a little jealous of the planning board that they only have to do their comprehensive long range plan update every 20 years. But <laughs> I'm also, you know, the, the flip side of that is that we can be you know um a little bit more responsive to our maybe ours is not quite as difficult to update as the you know envision conquered because it's not 20 years old thanks and just a last comment picking up on what diane mentioned about so sort of the the various plants that have recreation in their title I, I think the plan that was funded last year for the recreation department i, I describe it and, and I think Anna described it as a holistic plan, meaning that it largely dealt with recreation facilities. Yeah. It, it's, it had a major in recreation facilities and a minor in other recreational assets. And maybe, you know, I, I view your plan as sort of just the, the opposite, major in passive assets and maybe minor in other recreational assets. Because I think the town needs to think about recreational assets kind of holistically. So the coordination, I think, between the plans um, it's probably worthy of additional thought, I think. I think that's right. But I think that, um, you know, Anna's plan, the recreation plan, that's bound by one state statute, right? And the open space and recreation plan is governed by another. So sure. in order for us to, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a state level question. Why don't you have these documents married to reduce the burden on communities? Because you know, recreation is a big part of the OSRP update, but Anna is completing this strategic facilities plan solely for recreation purposes, it has nothing to do with conservation land updates. So we can certainly take her information and have that inform the open space and recreation plan update, but one cannot substitute for the other. We will not. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I, okay. I, wasn't, I wasn't suggesting that at all. I was just suggesting so the Venn diagram, the, the overlap of, of the plan. Agreed. Because, Agreed. Yeah. I, yes, I, 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 <laughs> I agree. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Sure. That's very helpful, Nancy. Um, so I was just um, going to observe that um, for the open space and recreation plan that Dealey is approaching, um, um, you can think of recreation and you can think of recreation. 
and the open space and recreation plan may be more in the category of recreation rather than what the recreation department's looking at. The other thing is, um, it's, it. <laughs> it's always um, going back to what Di Diane was asking about using um, open space for housing. Um, it 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 can be a difficult thing for me to see open space always looked at for housing purposes and as a trade-off between protecting one or accomplishing the other. You have to have one or the other. Um, there are municipal properties and there are other entities in town that own property that's not designated for open space necessarily. So I would think maybe there's an opportunity to look beyond open space properties at other municipal or other town agency owned properties for um, different kinds of uses, um, including uh, housing, affordable housing. So not just, um, you know, you hear, you hear it all the time, um, you know, somebody sees an empty piece of land and wants to develop it for this, that, or the other thing. And the value of open passive open space is often discounted in that process. So just a thought, there's other municipal properties. You know, that's that's so wise, Nancy. There's a there is a, a principle that um a Concordian uh, Jay Forrester used to talk about it, which was incompletion. You know, that you you look at open space and you think, oh, it's just oh, there. It'll yeah. just waiting for something. And then originally thought about it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you're asking us to think about if, um, open space as exactly that, not as incompletion, but completion, the yeah. completed open space. And that's, that's, a, that's, that's a, a wonderful discourse. Thank you so yeah. much. Charles. Um, Diane, in um, terms of getting um, affordable housing on, on potential acquisitions of open space is pretty tough slog. I've been on the Concord Housing Foundation for many years. And uh, an example of this is where the, um, some of the land up uh, off of Balls Hill Road the, the, um, uh, was, was contemplated for, for being purchased. Uh, the, my, the late Terry Rothamo made this point that why not have an affordable house right at the end of Balls Hill Road, uh, which would have very low impact on the rest of the property. The, and the property owner refused to sell it to us if they if it had that. Hmm. So these are the these are these are just the realities. So so an interesting thing is that there was a perfectly good house that um, could have served that function that Mass Audubon tore down, and it was well placed outside the main. Hmm. You know to do that. Anyway, it was a little frustrating to see that. And I'll take my hand down. Yeah, Charles, thank you so much for that that education. Discouraging though it may be. Um, Andrew and then Marcia. Um, yeah, I just have a question. I, I might have missed it and sorry if I did. The the hundred thousand dollar number, where did that come from? Because it sounded like you had said that the Envision Concord had taken 160,000 and you just decided you didn't need as much, so you just cut the number down. But would was there discussion with a consultant who's done this kind of thing before to get that number because it's just it seems like a ballpark just thrown out there so I just wanted some if, if you had any supporting um, info about that would be great yep so that is with our past experience of working with the Conway School of Design who did our last update um, we seriously underfunded that uh, it was work talking to other communities that have had recent plan updates um, that vary wildly from 10,000 to, you know, over $100,000. Um, and the people who um, have used or requested or had less funds to, to um, put towards a consultant have all said, um, biggest mistake we ever made. And you know, I as I put this proposal together, um, you know, some of you know that we have been uh, short-staffed since June, um, and it is um, 
very challenging for town departments that are small to be understaffed. Uh, so that was a consideration that there's very little that we can do as town staff to um, do a lot of the writing. Um, we will be relying on volunteers for a lot of this, um, but we can't rely on volunteers until we have them identified. So the $100,000 is on the high end of what communities have put towards these plans, um, but it is understanding the constraints that we're working under. Oh, thank you. Kimberly is certain, Delia, that if you could find the very person you wanted, our team that you wanted to do this and could do it for 80,000, um, that, that that money, that that's what you would spend. <laughs> of course, <laughs> and that money would come back to CPC. I mean, that that's right. I mean, that would be my goal is to right. do this for 75 or for 50. Right. Yeah, um, but to not be bound. Um, if Your integrity in to... regard is really important. Thank you. So, so um, also, I, I had a question because I, I also hadn't had much experience and knew of this. So I did look at the old plan that had the you know the pages and pages of maps and everything and the inventories of all the stuff. As part of this, are you contemplating a, a, a new inventory of the condition of all of the properties? Because I noticed that everything was good and excellent in 2015. So, you know, is, is that just like a, you know, I just don't know. Is, is that part of it? Because I think there was literally one property that was listed at fair and it was a parking lot. So I just didn't know <laughs> if, if there's a thought of, of that, that inventory can help inform applications for CPT funding, for example. Um, yeah, forward. that's that's a great question, Andrew. And the short answer to that is no, we will not be doing a land management inventory prior to the plan development, but we do intend to have that land management be part of the update. Um, yes, they say fair. Uh, most of them are, yes, good or excellent because they are you know i mean you walk any of these properties and there are very few properties that you know are in really bad condition um but that's really just to indicate um you know the, the high value of how this community looks and treats um conservation lands but it's it's um there's a lot more digging into that needs to be done with that for sure. Great, thanks. And I just have one final question. Is it, and, and this is again, total ignorance of these type of plans. Is it normal practice to allow them to fully expire for a couple of years before you start the process of re redoing it nope. or like? Nope, it, it is I, not. I so ours expired in February of this year. Um, and we have, we are behind on getting it back up to date. So. Um, so no, that's not a common practice. I, I would say towards a pressing need, that would be good to, I would say that in the, yes. in the application, <laughs> many communities are in the same position just because of other pressing priorities. That's what happens when plans are only valid for seven years. Um, but not ideal. And COVID has thrown everything into a, you know, locked hat. So, yep. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew, for those probing questions. Marsha. I just want to correct something. Delia said that we do our master plan every 20 years. No, the, the goal is to do it every 10 years. We're lucky if we can do it 10 years. The, the master plans for the community have been 1987, 2005, and 2018. So we're on a slightly more than 10-year time frame, but it's always less than 20. And it depends on state uh, funding from the music. Uh, from the town, not from um, other groups. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Marcia, for that for that for that careful correction. <laughs> Eve. Um, I just wanted to, to circle back because I think I maybe uh, misspoke the first time around. Um, and after hearing Paul ask his question, I realized really what my question was. And it does have to do with the application, Delia. It, it seemed to me from, from the paperwork here that the, the $100,000 was to hire a consultant to help uh, write a plan so that you could get money, so that you could then be approved by the state to go and ask, uh, write some grants and get some grant money to do some projects. 
But in actual actuality, the plan update from from 2015 has does a whole. I think it probably does a whole lot more. I mean, I haven't looked at the workbook that you mentioned, of course, but I I did. I used to work uh, distributing HUD funds, and I know what their requirements tend to look like. And and then what you said about it, you know, you submit it to them, and then they come a draft, and they come back and tell you if if you're going to meet their requirements or not. I would love to see in your application uh, a little bit more about what your because you've been doing this for so long. What like your to uh, idea of how this plan will be used as a tool for the town uh, would be like what what is your goal or what is the goal of the division uh, with this plan outside of just the requirements of the state? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's it. I'm done. That final comment um, is that we've heard some wonderful detailed discussion, Delia, and and the more detail that you can provide. Uh, for the public um, in terms of their review of this application and their appreciation for the application, uh, the, the more helpful it becomes. Uh, and, and it certainly allows us as a CPC, if we're able to fund it in any full way, uh, it allows us to be able to speak to it with confidence and, and then to refer people you know, to the detailed application itself. So um, that uh, thank you, Eve, for saying it so beautifully. And, and that, that then, um, that then moves us to the next project. Oh, Nancy, before we go on. Nancy, you're muted, so it's hard to hear what you're saying. I'm sure it's brilliant, but I can't hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to clarify something here. Are we talking about asking applicants to revise their applications or just provide additional information provide. in support of the applications that they've made? Yes. Okay, that's because, yeah, thank you. That's the clarification yeah. I was looking for. Yeah, and we've been doing this, you know, with, with applicants yeah. over the years, you know, just yeah, yeah. everything's yeah. great, but the more detail um, that you put into your project um, presentation, the, right. the you know, and what is reminded of the Civil War monument. I mean, all those letters, for instance. I mean, things that when the community goes back to it and looks at it, they they feel a compelling need to support it. So and the, the additional detail comes through as supplemental information. It's right. That's how it's come through in the past when we've asked absolutely, for it. Absolutely, Paul. And and yeah. so the more detail we can have up front now, I mean, you know, to, to enhance the uh, you know, application. I was just looking for the technical. <laughs> Yeah, I know what we were really asking for. And thank you. This is consistent with what I was hoping to hear. So. Okay. Thank you so much. And of our committee. <laughs> again and again, dear Nancy. Um, okay, the, the Warner's Pond. Oh my goodness, Delia, here we go. <laughs> Warner's Pond. Um, and I'm sure you have a presentation. Okay, well, Oops, I'm sorry, one second. Are you able to see this slideshow? Yep. yep. Okay, there it goes. Terrific. We're not hearing you, Delia, if you're speaking. So, uh, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Great. So, uh, I, a lot of this presentation is going to be on the project background, um, just to sort of bring people up to speed on where things are um, with this request, which is for $550,000 from both open space and recreation. It's a lot of money. Uh, CPC has already awarded um, a lot of money already towards Warner's Pond restoration. So I thought it would be important to just kind of bring everybody up to speed. Some of the members are new and and um, so I'm sort of starting from the beginning. I'm going to go through it somewhat quickly. We can come back to anything that people would like to talk about further. 
So Warner's Pond, uh, created by impounding um, uh, Neshoba Brook. The dam is down here by Commonwealth Ave. This dam was reconstructed in 2008. Um, the pond is a significant natural resource, both for fish and for wildlife. And it is a popular recreation area for fishing and paddling, though that use, both of those uses have diminished over the past 10 years. Um, this photograph here, these two on the right, show what the pond looks like in April versus what it looks like in June. Um, the pond has undergone significant and serious eutrophication, which is a common occurrence in these man-made ponds where eutrophication is where you have sediment loading that allows excessive plant growth, high nutrients coming in, and then you just lose open water. And that's what's happening here. Um, this is Neshoba Brook coming in here, comes around Scout Island and goes out down this leg towards the, the dam. Oops, I'm sorry. The dam is sort of off, um, kind of in this location here off the photograph. Um, so we have a lot of, you know, degraded water quality, um, degraded habitat. DEP lists this as impaired because of high nutrient loading, um, specifically high phosphorus. And this is what the pond looks like in the summer. There are excessive um, invasive species. There's coon war, coontail, fan wart, milfoil, water chestnut, um, as well as both the invasive and the native lilies. So it's it's it is not in great condition. <clears throat> um, in 2012, we completed a watershed management plan that was funded by CPA and that looked at, you know, really what the conditions of the pond were, what the historical uses were. Um, it looked at how it was getting to the point that it had got to it at this point. Um, it is at the base of the watershed. So this is in yellow is the watershed that is 47 square miles. Warner's is about 50 plus or minus acres. And it is at the base of an extensive watershed, which is part of the problem, quite honestly, because there's very little that we can do to control what you know problems are coming into Warner's Pond. Uh, the watershed management plan also looked at developing a hydrologic budget, uh, nutrient load modeling, and it looked at you know what what goals were we trying to accomplish. And how could we do those with different recommendations and management options? <clears throat> in 2018, also funded um, in great part by CPA, uh, we completed a Warner's Pond dredge feasibility study. Dredging was identified in the watershed management plan as the most effective long-term option for improving the ecological value and maintaining and improving the, the recreational capacity of the pond. Uh, so we looked at, okay, how are we going to accomplish that uh, dredging? And what we did, and I'll show this in a, a, a next slide, was focusing on two areas. Mm -hmm. And that was identified, well, let me hold on to that until we get to that slide. Um, it also looked at improving, this is the boat launch access to Horner's Pond that's off okay. Commonwealth Avenue here. And it's a it's a pretty unimproved, you know, access as many of our conservation land areas are. Uh, but it looked at putting in dedicated parking, uh, ADA parking, putting in a little, you know, pull out here that you could, you know, as, you know, if you had two way traffic, then you can have people pull off to one side. Um, and with this, what we looked at was primarily this being the primary dredge area. Again, as I mentioned, so here's Neshoba Brook. It comes down through this extensive wetland system. It slows down, hits the pond, and all the sediments drop out when it hits the ponds. But the flow of Neshoba comes around like this and comes through and then goes towards the dam that is located here. 
So this was identified by the engineers as the area of dredging that would provide the most value for what we were trying to accomplish, which was improving ecological value and improving recreational capacity. This area here to the north, we looked at because it was very coincident with the time that the Juro land was acquired and thought about maybe, you know, swimming, um, although, you know, this is only max nine feet depth, um, as this area would be as well, but also paddling and other, you know, access opportunities into the pond. So that's what we worked with, and we um, moved forward with permitting. Um, that was completed in the summer of this year. Um, we got the MEPA certificate in 2019. That's very early in the process. We got an order of conditions from the NRC. We received our Army Corps approval. We got a 401 water quality cert from DEP, as well as a Chapter 91 license and permit. And then this summer, we had the final designs uh, <coughs> developed based on these all these um, permit uh, plan revisions and then went out to bid <clears throat> in August of this year. And we got one bid back, and that was for nine and a half million dollars in September. <laughs> we have two and a half million that is available both from CPA and capital funding. So obviously there is a humongous discrepancy in the funding that we have available and what we need to accomplish what we thought we wanted to do. So I think there are currently three options. This is my, my opinion. Um, and I'm not the, I'm not the one who makes this decision on what the decision is, you know, what the path forward is. Um, we will need to go out and seek community input on these. Um, I've identified three options. There are very likely others, um, but the three that I, I can think of right now are the project doesn't go forward, we modify the project, or we take out the dam. And if we just decide we're going to walk away from this project, um, and you know the town has put significant money into evaluating what we would like to see and how we can accomplish that, we are going to end up with a system that just will eventually fill in over time. And I, I, I that does not seem like the best approach to me. Um, we could modify the scope and this is one option of what we could do. Um, this graphic shows Warner's Pond is both here in the green as well as in the blue and down to here. So this, this proposal would modify the dredging so that the blue areas would be dredged and the green areas become emergent wetlands. So basically the sediment that is removed from the bottom of the pond would be relocated into the green areas. Um, that reduces the trucking or eliminates the trucking. It's all just hydraulic dredge and just moving sediment around the pond. Um, it drastically reduces the size of Warner's Pond from, I, I would say, about a third. Um, this is very conceptual. This design came in a few days ago, um, but it was sort of identified here because this is you know, the prison's probably not going to mind if they have an emergent wetland here, nor is anybody going to mind here, because I think most people who live on the ponds like the open water habitat. Um, so these areas are not close to any neighborhoods. Um, and then you have this improved recreational capacity here. So that's an option that can be considered. This we did not include because it's this is really riverine in this location it flows quite nicely oops sorry um so these are the areas identified for the dredging and then as i said the spill the the spoil would be moved to these locations <clears throat> um the third option that is one of 
probably many, is to remove the, the dam at Warner's Pond. There are pros and cons. Um, I think I noted on here. Um, no, I did not. So <laughs> on a, a, a version that is not up on the screen, I <laughs> these are very preliminary considerations. And, and I know that there are more pros and more cons um, that you all could tell me, the community can tell me, and that is, it needs to be out for a public discussion with stakeholders and the community. So um, all of these options do. Um, so if the dam were removed, um, it reduces the need to have CPW maintain this. It's a costly dam. Um, there are upkeep requirements. Um, if the dam fails in some, you know, crazy storm that is a 500 year storm, that is, you know, problematic for downstream. Um, there, when that dam was reconstructed, actually, there was a port -a dam failure that took out the, some of the retaining wall just below the <clears throat> um, Shoburbrook Bakery. So, and that was a partial, that was just a partial <laughs> failure of the port -a dam. Um, so that is eliminated. Um, the habitat, when you take out a dam, it, it reconnects um, all kinds of stream um, capacity. And so you now have all this habitat and connectivity for all the fish species that doesn't exist now. They hit the dam and they can't go up any further. Um, and you may have, depending on how deep and how wide Neshoba Brook would be in that area, you might have the ability that you could paddle um, in a brook, but it would be different. It would not be the pond experience that um, people were used to up until just a few years ago. So cons, you know, you, you lose that, that pond fishing and paddling experience. You lose the open water aesthetic. The people that live around the pond might really hate this idea. Um, you lose that <laughs> historical feature um, that dam was created a long time ago, and um, it's written about in, in many, many writings. And we just, you know, within the past 20 years, the town recently, you know, reconstructed that. And that was also, you know, partially with CPA money. It was. I, so, remember, I remember the project, yeah. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> right before I got here. Well, it was, I, I was here when they when it was reconstructed. Um, so, you know, preliminary pros and cons. Um, and so the, the proposal that is in front of you is here because, you know, we, we got the, the bids in, in early September. Um, CPC applications are due in mid-September, um, and it's a once a year application. We needed to put in, a, in an application, um, knowing that it's not, you know, I'm not the one to make the decision on whether this is the right thing to move forward with dredging or to do nothing or, you know, what needs to happen. I needed to put in an application so that we could lock something in place um, to request funding. So this funding is for 50000 for the applicant. I mean, I'm sorry, for the consultant to evaluate and for us to go out and um, obtain that community feedback. Um, it's going to be a public forum that we will, uh, actually we'll do that public forum without, we'll just do that in house um, because we need to do that now before we have you know, the consultant on board with more funding and, and we need to decide the approach moving forward. So, I think that public outreach is um, a public forum with the community, but it's also reaching out to the prison. It's reaching out to the recreation <laughs> department with Jero. It's reaching out to the Boy Scouts of America. They own Scout Island, which is in the middle of the pond and really deciding, you know, how does the community want to move forward on this? And then the second larger part of the request is for $500,000 towards the additional funding. So I, I just today got very preliminary cost estimates from the consultant um, for that modified dredge. It, it is about $4 million. 
And as I said, we have 2.5 2 and removing the dam is about 2.3. So, you know, I mean, we have 2.5. Does the town want to take that 2.5 and reallocate that to removing the dam? And there would be, you know, additional permitting and, you know, sediment testing and all kinds of things that would ha have to happen first. But I think we just need to have a conversation about where we need to go with that. And I think that, I think that is it. And I am sure you will have many questions. Thank you, Delia, so much. Um, Okay, there are, um, uh, uh, Paul and Andrew uh, have focused on this particular project and um, I see Nancy has also raised her hand. Let's, let, let's start with Paul and Andrew and then Nancy will go right to you. Yeah, I'll wait. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> uh, let, let me start with the, the 800 pound gorilla that you put in front of us here. Um, I'm not sure whether you want us to evaluate the current application or and and sort of ignore sort of the various um, options or, or what we're I, I'm prepared to qu provide questions on the the application, which is focused on, I guess, continuing uh, the, the sequence of CPC funding towards dredging and the dredging project because that's that's one of what's that's what's in front of us. Um, but you presented some options that I think is it's well beyond the ability of this committee to evaluate. And if we even start to do that, it would take five hours. And so I don't know, Diane, should we just stick to the application that's in front of you know, us? Well, I'm, I'm wondering whether what we should ask, and it really is a technical question, isn't it? Um, whether the, the pond would regress dramatically, Delia, if you were to withdraw the application, wait a year, and get community feedback, consensus among the community as to how to go, as, as to how we go forward. Um, because how we are going to balance um, both going forward and dealing with community input simultaneously is, is um, complicated at best. Uh, if you ran the zoo and you had a magic wand and, you know, Elliot McGrew, who was no more than two, uh, he knew just what he'd do, you know, Dr. Seuss. I mean, what would, what would you do? So, so I, I'm prepared to kind of put some questions before dealing, but maybe you would ask that first. Yeah, I'm, I'd like to ask that overall question first, Paul, if you don't mind. Yes, yeah. sure. No, no. Is she frozen on everybody else's screen, too? <laughs> Okay. She's frozen. No, <laughs> so I've been frozen too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. Delia, yeah, as you may know, we can't we can't quite hear you. Um I, I, I would like to make a recommendation, and that is that we give um I don't think a year is going to make a difference. Yeah. Um agree. Okay. critical There's to that. deciding how the project moves. Oops. Totally. Okay. Oh, there she is. There she is again. Okay. But not working. Can you hear me? Then yes. now we can. Okay. Yeah, now we can. Okay. Okay. I really need a new computer. Yes, you got an unstable <laughs> connection. <laughs> Go ahead. On. Okay. Um, no, I think community feedback is going to be critical. Um, and I mean, I know I see Marsha is still on the call. Um, Marsha, you can chime in if you think there's anything different from what I'm thinking, but I don't think a year is going to make a difference if this is put on hold. Okay. The reason I ask is because um, I don't think the cost of the dredging is going to escalate that, oh, but much of that 7 million. <laughs> I can't I imagine it will, but who knows? I mean, I just, I think the, what is critical right now is that, and, and Paul has articulated it so beautifully, is that our committee really cannot take the responsibility for adjudicating mm -mm. Those three projects. No, oh, and I'm sorry oh, if I was. I'm sorry if I was um, putting it forward that the committee should be making that decision. It was oh, more. you are not Delia. Just sort of saying these are the options. Yeah. I mean, the integrity um, of your presentation is thinking clear. about. I mean, but I think what it does is it compels us to suggest that we withdraw this application, 
and, and spend um, a year you know, getting community consensus around it, figuring out what the pros and cons are, um, discerning, you know, would, does the town have some money to put aside to help with this effort, plus the CPC funding, plus others, if the, if the vote is the overwhelming sensibility of the town, is that massive dredging needs to take place? I mean, there, there's just a lot of discussion that the town needs to have before you know, we can really evaluate the project. Well, Diane, just- um, Yes, go ahead, Paul. Sort of started the question, but the Delia sort of separated this application, I think, into two parts. One was the 500,000 for dredging and then $50,000 for additional thinking. Um, you know, the additional thinking part may be very worthwhile for C CPC funding. I'm not sure. I just kind of throw that out there. I, I, I think the, the the project has some issues and some, and some pro problems, not the least of which is cost. Um, there are lots of technical questions that I you know I, I think are probably not appropriate to go into tonight, Thank given you. the discussion here. But I do have one overall question I'd like to ask, and that's sort of the uh, this project dates back to like 2014 when it was when it first was studied. Then there's been a series of funding has the rat and at some point Giro was part of that because Giro as originally conceived was going to have a beach and was going to have a, a boat launch it was going to have a boardwalk it was going to have access to the water um that whole Giro plan um is, is quite different and I, I don't view that we're not discussing Giro here but it, it, one respond although you can look at it from Giro is is, is not going to the recreation part is not going to benefit Jerome because access is not really planned right now. So I'm just wondering if the whole rationale for dredging, uh, because part of this recreation, you know, you got, you got to enter the water from, from somewhere. It, if that has changed in your mind, Delia, given changes that have occurred in the past five years, you know, with Jerome and, and other things. So as we were completing the dredging feasibility study, the town acquired Jiro, and we wanted to have the ability to think about that. Um, so it was included in the in the in the dredging feasibility, um, and it was. I mean, there were other reasons that it was included in, but but that that played into that decision. Um, the town at that time had not being gifted the White Ponds Associate. Right. Yeah. You know, so so now the town has a public town. Beach. Beach, yeah. <laughs> Beach. Beach oh. at the White Ponds, but we're struggling with water quality issues and trying to manage it. Sure. Um, but you know, I mean Warner's Ponds, if you talk to if you talk to people who swam at Warner's 50 years ago. There were yeah. snapping turtles, there were leeches. It was not your sort of, you know, favored swimming hole. It was where you went to take swimming lessons and learn how to swim and, you know, that sort of thing. That won't change if it was dredged at Giro. That would, that would still, um, it would, it would be an, you know, it would be a, um, well, I, I grew up swimming in Lake Iroquois. So that, that's what, that, that's what it was like. Um, so I, I don't have anything against <laughs> snapping turtles and leeches, but otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there, there's, so, there's no question, but that, and, and Paul, you, you point to something that, you know, when, when the original drill plan was presented to the town, there were all sorts of ambitious suggestions about how the property was going to be used. And many of those fell through. You know, many of those were both infeasible and not and, and not something that could be ultimately supported. Um, exactly, and, but it, it's not. Oh, um, oh, whoops! Right. But I, I think a big, a, a huge expenditure of money towards dredging really has that a strong rationale. And and right now, the remaining access yeah. to the pond would be through the the Commonwealth Avenue right of way, and it's mm -hmm. the only the only place you can park cars and put boats in there. So I, I think re, I think back to sort of the original discussion, rethinking the project and maybe um, getting into a planning mode and deferring additional funding. There's already about 
almost a million dollars or of funding of CPC in there already, and this was another five fifty. And then you were saying next year you'd ask for another five hundred thousand. So I, I think I, I don't want to prejudge it here. This is a questioning session, but there are enough questions on the recreational benefits and the ecological benefits. Um, especially, you, you note that the, the nutrients are largely out of control of this project. They're coming from the watershed. So uh, there are just a lot of questions that I think. I don't want to take up a lot of time here, Delia. And you know, some of them we talked about when we were at a pond side there. But uh, I think, given your honest appraisal about you know the, the options here, I think we need to go back to the drawing board and figure out how CPC can help in some way, maybe other than another half million dollars of dredging this year. Right. I'll, I'll just I'll leave it at that, Diane. But also, and Paul, you made so many good points, and you know, and how we can support Delia as she tries to adjudicate all this and figure it out. And Andrew, you you have you have, you have <laughs> right of right of next questions. So no, no, my question was more of a more of a procedural um, one. If if it's on the table to possibly withdraw this the existing larger chunk of the application, would it make sense? To provide supplement of what what would be done with the fifty thousand dollars worth of consulting costs, maybe in light of you know basically say hey we're planning all these public forums, we have we've requested fifty thousand dollars we'd still like to use it to see what see what those public forums and the fees like basically take your feasibility of of this other dredging plan or something that comes out of the public forums so that you're not wasting another three years you know, trying to, to come up with something, you know, maybe hit the ground running because you already have the application submitted for an amount that might get you some of the way, just an idea. So you're yeah, not... Andrew, that's such a good comment because uh, that funding could be used for a, a mailing to the, to the town with lots of information so that people, not just to abut the property um, and the waterway, but, you know, throughout the town to consider you know, what kind of resources we want to use as a town to support something like this. I mean, there are many ways in which such money could be used. Um, and, and Delia, I, you... There goes Diane. That because, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, never mind. Uh, okay, Nancy, <laughs> you have a comment. Um, I was... I was just um, thinking originally along the same lines as other people are thinking uh, uh, constructive ways to use $50,000 to maybe get a sense of the community or I don't know exactly how you would structure that work for $50,000. I know Delia, you said that um, the town had work to do first, but how is that gonna be staffed? And does $50,000 help that? <laughs> effort of outreach or is is it too little so and fifty thousand dollars that money would not be available until after july one so um in my opinion i think the question needs to be asked sooner so sooner rather than later. rather than later so that we are in a position to so you know, we would use that, you know, that consultant money would then be used to further the plans that the community decides. And I mean, I, yes, we have a lot on our plate, Nancy, as, as you know, better than, than many people. Um, and, but it's, it's something that the, the town has put a lot of money towards. I know. Um, NRC mm -hmm. has supported for a long time. Um, so, I think, I think that's a huge, that, it's a huge question, I think, for yeah. the entire town and how yeah. to structure that involvement. No doubt. I think let, first. Step. Let, let, let's remember that there's a CPC has already funded eight, nine hundred thousand dollars, which is kind of in the bank, right? The, the quote unquote bank. So there's available funds from CPC which are unused, right? I think some of those funds have been used actually. Um, so we have 2.5 million set aside and I would have to double check on those numbers. I meant to do that before the meeting, but um, I'm going to say it is a roughly equal split 
between CPA and capital funding. It's not exactly equal, but they're close. Thank you. Eve? Um, just a very simple question. Does this whole project fall under the open space plan that we just discussed with the consultant doing research mm -hmm. there? It does in terms of, you know, this was identified as a goal um, in the last update. So, you know, we report on the progress and we can say we got to this point and, you know, <laughs> I mean, it won't have a lot of detail because it's one of, you know, dozens of goals, but um, it, it, it will be reported on in the plan as, as far as its progress. That's a good question, Eve. Mm -hmm. John? Diane, I'll just put a much bigger question out. Um, we've already discussed um, earlier the kind of, I don't call them trade-offs, but the distinction between recreation land and um, housing, uh, low-income housing land. In, in the, which I wasn't at, but many of you were, the select board meeting yes. um, and the hesitations or perhaps even uh, well, the unwillingness to vote on Christopher Heights. Has any of that been directed at our monies, our, our banked monies like these? Well, um, you're going to see in the next presentation, John, um, you're going you're gonna to hear a discussion about that from Lee Smith. And I see that Liz has been able to join us from Lee and Liz. So um, I, we will be addressing, we'll be addressing that very directly and specifically. And I know that because I've been attending housing committee meetings all summer um, in, in anticipation of uh, affordable housing discussions here on the CPC um, and, um, and, and, and attending as well, obviously, all the select board discourse on all this. So um, if you could hold your question, John, until, unless it directly abuts something about the land that Delia is, deals with. In, on the Giro Park. I mean, otherwise, I think if you don't mind holding that. It, it, I mean, the, the point is obvious. If you didn't spend this for dredging, um, right. there, there are other uses that are um, vital in the town. Absolutely. Um, how those get transferred and what the legal aspects of it are is, is I've discovered more complicated than I understand. For instance, it might require a town meeting vote right. to change that. Hmm. From one, I you know our warrant presentation to the town becomes potentially increasingly complicated. John, um, we're going to need good legal minds. Um, you and Andrew, we're going to lean on you heavily <laughs> to figure out you know how all and, of this and, works. And, and, and Burton, and Burton, but he's I, he's he's um I I don't know if he's here. I see his box here that says Burton. I, Flint, I am Burton, on. Sorry. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. I just had not heard your voice and Burton. Um, uh, and I certainly did not mean to slight that um, somebody on whom I rely often. So thank you. Um, so I, I think Delia, uh, back to the drawing board for you a little bit. And maybe you can let us know what you and Marsha and others decide about how to go forward with this application. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Sounds like a plan. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Concord Housing Development Corporation, um, Asbert River Bluff, housing pre-development. Um, we are fortunate to have Lee Smith here and Liz Russ has joined us and Linda Escobedo, who's been a, a, a significant force in supporting um, affordable housing in the town and was courageous on Monday night in speaking to it. Yeah. And so Linda, thank you. Exactly. Uh, so now we have, um, I'm, we're gonna turn this over to Lee. Good evening, thanks for having me. I'm Lee Smith, I'm the chair of the Concord Housing Development Corporation. Um, I do have a very brief presentation that um, I submitted. I'm hoping um, someone could share the screen for me. I can. And can you make sure that, that Lee can, can be a co-host so he can use his screen? 
I was hoping Anne would actually. <laughs> oh, if you've got, if she's got them. I noticed. I knew she yeah, said, knew you sent them, but I wasn't sure. Okay, thank you, Anne. Thank, thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Um, so going the wrong direction. That's the last slide. <laughs> Sorry, give, give me a minute to uh, figure this out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Oops. I, I want to remind the committee that in our first meeting in September, I suggested to us that uh, where there are urgent and unexpected needs but on the part of the town, that applications in, the, in their nature can change in a way that is atypical. So I just want to remind us that we've discussed that a little bit. And okay, um, you can go to the next slide. That's just the introduction. Um, so this, this um, application involves the project that we call Asset River Bluff, which is um, a, a total of six acres that was acquired over the summer, five acres of which is going to be conserved as, as open space and one acre is to be developed for community housing, specifically um, deed restricted affordable housing purposes. Um, I know many of you were nice enough to come to the site a few weeks ago. So you saw the existing structure, which is a two unit apartment that is presently rented. One of the units is rented, one of the units is vacant. And then if you were looking at the house to the right is a wooded area that uh, abuts the Bruce Freeman rail trail. And that is the area where we plan to develop uh, three uh, new construction uh, affordable housing units. Uh, so we submitted an application before the deadline for $100,000 to basically cover pre-development costs, which include things like um, site plan design, permitting, um, evaluation of different options, um, th things of that nature, as well as also consideration of any rehabilitation or renovation that may be needed for the existing structure. So I'd like you to consider this presentation in kind of in, in, in two parts in that um, we're all, today we're asking if whether the, the committee would consider um, an amendment to the application to increase the amount up to uh, $400,000. Mm -hmm. And as um, Diane mentioned, um, we could attribute this to an unexpected and, and urgent need um, to advance affordable housing in Concord. And that is partially due to literally late breaking news as, as some people have alluded to earlier in the meeting in that um, Last night, the select board um, elected not to support the request from the Affordable Housing Trust to commit an additional $1 million towards the Junction Village Christopher Heights project. Um, as, as someone mentioned, they, they wouldn't even vote on it. There wasn't, Linda made a motion to support it and there was no second, so there was no vote. Um, so that effectively kills the Junction Village project that would have created 83 new affordable assisted living units um, off of uh, Winthrop Street. So that um, also completely changes the town's predictions for um, remaining above the 10% on the subsidized housing inventory or, or SHI. So I think bottom line is as of today, every single unit counts. We've got a long way to go. We're expected to fall below the 10% SHI um, once the census numbers are, are recalculated within the next few months. Um, so we're thinking, and again, this is all hot off the press, literally. So we're we're still thinking this through ourselves as, as, a, as a board, but um, we're thinking this, this could be an opportunity to advance the Asset River Bluff project, which we um, initially had projected to be basically a five-year project, give or take before all five units could come online. But um, with Junction Village going away, if there were additional funds available, we may be able to expedite that project and, and get those done much sooner. Um, I'll note that um, in addition to the request for either 100 or, or 400, depending on 
the feelings of, of your committee. We also have $50,000 worth of, of funds that have been contributed by the Concord Housing Foundation for, for this project. Um, next slide, please. So as, as I said, um, I described earlier, the, the uh, site is really two land areas, one which is known as 406 Old Marlboro Road, which is the existing unit. Um, there we could use the funds for capital improvements that would be required in order to be considered to be added to the subsidized housing inventory. There's also cost associated with um, doing the, the regulatory work with uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development that's required to get the deed restrictions on, on the units and, and thereby on the subsidized housing inventory. Um, and then the <clears throat> presently undeveloped land is obviously, call it, let's call it three quarters of an acre. And there um, it's presently all wooded and we're, we're just really beginning the, the site plan and, and design process with some, some concepts that you'll, you'll see in a moment. And um, costs from the CPC there could be used for uh, those, those conceptual site plans, designs, permitting, which will be extensive um, pre-construction activities, including uh, site clearing, utilities, um, going through the public process and the um, budgeting construction estimates, um, and also clearing the land utilities installation, including septic. And we're also looking very closely at um, developing these units as, as fossil free uh, residential units. So the point really is, is that uh, if there's an opportunity for additional funding, as I said, um, we, we might be able to accelerate this project in a, in a significant way. Um, next slide, please. So this is our really our first concept sketch plan. I don't know if it's possible to zoom in on that. Right, so the existing house is you see there's a line almost in the middle of the page, kind of on an angle. Uh, and there's two red dots just to the left of that. That is the, the uh, existing dwelling unit with uh, two apartments. And if you look to the left of that, that's the current proposed location of a driveway off of Old Marlboro Road, uh, curving around to the right. And you can see uh, three rectangles, building one, building two, and building three. And those are the initial conceptual locations for the three units that would include um, parking and also I think sufficient access for emergency services. Um, we're gonna continue to, to drill down on this and work with our um, engineer and planner on, on what this might look like. And once CHTC is, something is, is more comfortable with it, we'll, we'll start a public process to receive input on, on from the community as to what what they might prefer. Um, next slide, please. So this is the project timeline that we developed in around July of, of this year. Um, we've already acquired the property, um, as you can see. And without going through every item, um, you can see that we, we had the timeline going through. Um, sorry, let's see that. Um, approximately 2028 to 2029 for occupancy. So um, if, if significant additional funds became available, um, including, you know, I'll expand on this in a moment, including the funds, the additional funds that haven't even been considered yet required to what we call buy down, which is um, to subsidize the developer's cost of building the units. Whereas it just says, uh, you know, from a, a simple, explanation if the house is going if, if the house was going to cost 500,000 to build the developer needs to make some profit so he's selling it for 700,000 if we want it to be affordable we're going to have to pay the developer essentially money to um, incentivize the developer to sell it at the price that we're, we're looking to restrict it at hopefully that makes sense so we, we haven't um, explored avenues for that funding yet but Again, kind of going back to um, the death of the Junction Village Christopher Heights project, there are um, two million dollars presently set aside for that project that could potentially be reallocated. One million of that is from the CPC, 
Um, another million, I believe, is from free cash. And we also have an additional million presently in the coffers of the Affordable Housing Trust. So all that meaning to say that um, we might have, we might be a long way towards having the buy down funds in hand a lot sooner than, than we might have thought um, a few weeks or a few months ago. So that is my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, and and um, Charles and Nancy, this was your project to look at. Um, let's hear from you first and then turn to other members of the committee. So Charles, why don't you start us, please? Oh, sorry. No, you're all set. On... Okay. Um, so so um, <clears throat> this is something new to take in. Um, this is the schedule. Um, I guess my main, my only real question is kind of a, a small one, perhaps, is that as far as the existing uh, uh, house house is concerned, um, am I assuming that the uh, that that the 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 renovation of that house is an integral pro integral part of the uh, of the contract for for a developer. We're looking at it right now as the existing structure being separate from the a, a developer proposal. Um, one concept that we have, and we haven't advanced it in any significant way, was if once they were on the subsidized housing inventory, perhaps giving them to the um, Concord Housing Authority. As, as one option. Um, the, the, the primary issue there from a funding perspective is that before DHCD will consider adding it to the SHI, it has to meet certain basic standards in terms of condition. For example, um, the roof has to have a, a life expectancy of I think at least 15 years or something like that. And plus just the condition of the unit, certainly habitable, but it, um, it needs some upgrades. Um, probably the the HVAC system, um, maybe some some plumbing, some um, issues with the public, not public, but um, safety issues with railings, things of that nature. Just but basically buffing them up to to make them um, attractive for new tenants. And that could proceed quickly, right? I'm sorry, Charles. Yes. Um, yes. This means that that. Uh, the, for example, that you have to make sure have a septic, the septic system is right behind the house, right? Right. Um, I believe the septic system for the existing structure past Title V, there will be new, probably, I think, three new septic systems um, needed for the three new units, but that hasn't been determined with uh, any specificity yet. Liz? You're on mute. Sorry, sorry. I'm not hearing you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Hi, Liz Russ. Thank you. Um, I think that just to echo um, what Lee said, um, yeah, the idea is to to um, put the capital improvements into the existing home with uh, funds that um, with the Concord Housing Foundation funds, um, and to start with those in this fiscal year. And then with the, some of the CPA funds that would be available in July. So it's kind of constrained by the funding available, but to do that as separate effort and not um, by through the developer, but by through the CHDC efforts themselves, through the, um, the various capital improvements that Lee mentioned, the septic there is fine by itself. And so it would be that, and then the new construction would have its own um, wastewater uh, plan, um, maybe one system, that's shared between the three homes or, or multiple, but that's another piece. Okay, so that means that the, um, uh, you still have that there. That means that the, the new access road has to skirt the septic field, whatever, whatever, <laughs> whatever that is. Um, no, the, the, the driveway can go over the septic field. Really? Mm -hmm. 
It's really oh, just the um, the collection tank part that it can't go over. So the you know the septic field has where mm -hmm. the connections feed in. But um, that's, that's why we have the um, the experts on on retainer who are working on all of that. Okay, and then I guess my comment is is uh, please use the concrete housing foundation funds as soon as possible, as soon as you need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they're not quite in, in the bank yet. So I think that they're w once they get to the CHGC, they will be deployed oh, okay. imminently. Right. Yeah, yeah. That, that's certainly the plan. I, I just want to make one other clarification, if I didn't say it already. One of the units is vacant. We could move quickly mm -hmm. towards um, getting that one on the SHI. But the second unit that is occupied um, we, we couldn't really begin that process until it became vacant and we have no plans to ask the current tenant to leave. So that's kind of a question for down the road, but um, that's where we are. Thank you, Lee, for that. Um, it's, it's so, uh, you know, this is a this is a complicated but important discussion <laughs> and it may take, you know, us taking it into the next our next meeting as well to, you know, flesh out details. And but um, so, Nancy. Um, I am out of my league here in terms <laughs> of the, the, uh, the steps that are going to need to be taken for this, but the concept of getting those uh, two units, hopefully, um, moving more quickly seems, seems wise. And I'm just curious, more curious to know a little bit about the process. And that's my job. And my computer is going to automatically shut down in just a few minutes. So oh, no. I'm sorry, <laughs> it seems to be a night for, I just got a notice and, and I apparently can log back in, but that's what's gonna happen before too long. Oh, Nancy, um, if, 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 if we're not able to reconnect, you can feel free to reach out to Liz and me and we could um, who's saying back up to speed. Lee? Lee is saying oh, that. You, are. You, moved, you moved on the screen. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, I'll do that. The, the last page of the presentation has um, kind of the process and then with the timeline yeah. it could be accelerated, but that really lays out the steps and we're glad to talk in more detail. The one that was, that was in July 22 though, but isn't that up, gonna be updated now if you, if you obtain additional funding? If we attain additional funding, the dates might uh, shift up, um, yeah. but currently that's the process, right? Yeah, in terms yeah. Of yeah. The process is to, or the timing. The, the point is to accelerate the timing. Yes, there's two family houses as well um, as the, oh. the 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 three independently standing houses, um, all of which can do nothing but but enhance the the character of the town. John. Yeah. Um, two two big big picture questions again. Um, do we know, oh, you or Anne, uh, any clearer picture on our totals? that we have available. Well, it's getting very complicated, isn't it, John? Because if, um, if, if, if Delia withdraws her application, so that's one. Then two, we have already put aside a million dollars in CPC funding for the Junction Village. So that's, that's out there in some way or another. Three, we gave money to the West. Oh no. We can do planting and um, all sorts of things uh, around the Junction Village project. Do you all remember that? Mm -hmm. And so, when, when we talked with them about would it go forward if Junction Village didn't, because it was predicated, if you remember, on the existence of heavy machinery that was yeah. going to help them with that process. Yeah. So in, in point of fact, John, we have some very interesting discussions to have about you know what there it, there are it would appear to be considerable residual funds sure let um, me let me just split my my question in, in two parts okay um, sorry, set, set aside set aside the return of the junction village christopher heights money from right. two different from apparently from two different sources um do we know our our state total our state and local total have we got any clearer picture of just what we would, right. without those returns, what yeah. would we have to spend? And, 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 and can, I mean, the obvious logical next step is, can you fit the 400,000 into that number? Right. Um, so then yeah. the second question is when, 
when and who has to make decisions is dead really dead and who has to make decisions about those monies actually coming back to our for reallocation and that we have a lot of discussion to have to have don't we we have to speak with town lawyers and other people to figure out our, our the, the the wisdom on our own committee about how those fundings uh can they come back to us to use this year do they have to be voted on by the town first to come back to us to use i mean there's a lot there's process process that, that we've not had to deal with and at least that's why i split the question in half I, I, um, do, do we know do we know regardless of those steps do we know right. what we have to spend no john your question is is prudent and and important and do we have a, a final number right now uh no we don't those numbers typically come out in mid-november that's what i thought city. yes so we don't have the numbers yet so John, we, we patience is a virtue, be virtuous is the ice cream parlor that we, we used to go to when I was growing up. <laughs> a big sign of patience is because the lines were always you know tremendous. Um it is a um we have a we have, we have some complex process issues on our plate. Linda Escobedo, I see your face. Does that mean you have something to add? Well, I would just say that um Legal counsel did provide um, an opinion about the multiple steps that would be required to unwind the various funding sources for Christopher ah. Heights. Um, but there, even with that legal opinion, there is so that was included in the packets, select board packet um, uh, for yesterday's meeting, oh, yeah. I yeah. believe. Um, and but even with that legal opinion, there, you know, is. Um, clearly more discussion that would need to be had in terms of how that gets unwound. And um, my understanding is that the CPC allocation would have to go to town meeting um, to be um, unwound, so to speak. Yeah, that's yeah. what I understood, right. Yeah. yeah. And that the um, comment that was made at the select board meeting was um, that the 1 million that had been allocated by the town as Lee said, would uh, at this point go back to free cash. Okay. So um, as I say, there are many. And we have one million. <laughs> and that we know was was put for Junction Village and and for affordable housing. So and 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 you know by by both right and 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 appropriately. So we have a lot of questions, don't we? And and not necessarily um, conclusions. Thank sure. you so much. So. Um, may I make a recommendation to the committee, and you know, please disagree with me if you think this is wrong. Um, I, I think we have a clear sense for how the requested $100,000 from um, uh, the, the Concord Housing Development Corporation would be used a year from now uh, for upgrading or for, for other efforts or, or needs. And we know that, that, that that's something on which we can proceed. We also know that that, that particular request can be changed under the urgent and unexpected town needs. And so we will turn back to Lee and to, and, and to Liz and ask them if they can please expand that application to give us some insight into how that those, those additional fundings and requests might be used. In the meantime, uh, we have a responsibility as a committee uh, to try to discern how much, for, we have to wait till mid-November to figure out how much money we have, John, a, a prudent and important question, but we also have to, to figure out if in fact the town were to free up that money, can we in our own considerations about future affordable housing concerns, can we take that into account as we consider how we support various projects going forward. And if Delia's project, which was a $500,000 project, is withdrawn and is only $50,000, that gives us some excess funding, including um, the fact that we thought or anticipated we'd have excess funding anyway. You know, we might find that we have quite a bit of money to put toward affordable housing um, if it can be used effectively and appropriately. Um, by the affordable housing you know, committees. So there's a lot to be considered um, and, and a lot to try to discern. Uh, when is our next meeting? I'm sorry, I'm up here in, in New Hampshire and I don't have anything with me. When is our next meeting? It's 
it's November 1st. November 1st, okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Does, does anybody disapprove of, of us holding this until the next next meeting? Um, no. Waiting to figure out you know, what our funding might look like <clears throat> and trying to discern how best. Don't object, it's a, it's a logical, a logical delay. <laughs> And does that make sense to the committee mm. as a whole? How does how does it look to um, Liz and Lee to wait? You right. don't need that. <clears throat> That's no, I mean, yeah, you, I, I acknowledge we, we haven't submitted any additional information yet, so we didn't yeah. really expect you. It's really more of a, a gating issue as to whether you'd even consider it. Um, if the answer is yes, then we can certainly supplement our existing application to better explain the sources and uses, et cetera. Um, and in any event, the money, if everything goes perfectly, won't be available till uh, July 1 anyway, so it won't really change anything for us other than for planning purposes. Yeah. Thank <clears throat> you so much. Um, Paul, I see your hand. Yeah, just following up on your, um, I don't know how you phrase it, the emergency and needed area to supplement affordable housing issues are there maybe we can defer to the next call but are there additional stakeholders other than the ones on this call that we could reach out for ideas in a category just something to think about i'm i'm not i mean charles is more charles elizabeth and lee are more aware of the of the um community of idea generators but um i, I think it's worthwhile reaching out beyond the people on this call I think that's wise, Paul, and I, I suspect they will. I suspect they'll go back to their various committees. I mean, that would be my presumption. And knowing the way they've tended to behave in the past, which is collegially and, and collaboratively, my suspicion is they will go back to their committees and discuss all of this. In the meanwhile, we'll try to get our P's and Q's in her and figure out how much money we have. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's just, there's, there's much that needs to be taken into consideration. I I just want to see how grateful I am for the the care of this of this committee. I mean, it is such a decent group of people. Andrew. Um. Yeah. No. My point was just when supplemental information is submitted related to the housing, it's probably important to include at least some notation of why this would be an emergency or why something unexpected happened. I feel like sometimes on the documentation side for our applications, at least it seems to have been a trend of not adding a little bit more explanation. And especially where we're, we received an application that was 100,000, now we're considering 500,000. Tying that together, you know, not just, not just the, the benefit of speeding it up, but also why this is unexpected would be right. useful to, to document. Yes, within, within the material submitted. Beautifully put, Andrew. And of course, it's not so much an emergency as it is an unexpected, um, you know, an unexpected need on the part of the town. And it was it's clearly unexpected because I think people all thought that the that the junction village, you know, was going to go forward. And in the absence of that, although the rumblings were already kind of out there, <laughs> you know, so I mean, I think that um we're disappointed, but but not entirely gobsmacked um, and surprised. So hearing, okay, Sarah, yes. Yeah, I just have a, a question related to what you told us earlier, Diane, about the select board yesterday. If they, de they determined not to vote, but is there an opportunity for another vote or is that it or nothing? That's it, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. The application from the Grantham Village, the Grantham, uh, um, the Grantham firm has been withdrawn. They had written formally to the town and withdrawn their application. Now, the only hope was to persuade them to come back with that application. Right, right, okay. But it's due, I believe Lee and Liz tell me, their, their application would be due October 24th to the okay. state. 27, for, like close. 27, yeah. okay, close, mm -hmm. for a reconsideration. And there, you know, there's kind of no way that, that that whole thing is gonna be reversed at this point, Sarah, that I can imagine. Um, and so the, re, the result is, is that, um, you know, I think that's dead in the water. And I don't think the three members of the select board who chose not to support it um, are going to change their minds. I mean, it did not appear last, last evening. 
as if there were a possible change of mind. Lee, do you have a different perspective on it? I don't, I agree with what you said, but um, I just wanted to add um, some commentary just based on my experience going through it. Um, that there was a, a prior meeting, um, for, I don't remember the exact date, but um, September, so. where at, at the select board, where the Affordable Housing Trust initially presented the, the request seeking support of the select board for the allocation of the million dollars, which is already appropriated. Not a no new funds are coming out of any pocket that's not already dedicated for affordable housing. Um, the developer was there and the uh, three members of the select board, obviously not Linda, really put him through the ringer and he was um, very upset, I'll put it that way. And that um, led him to conclude that the, the town is not a, 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 a supportive enough partner for this project to be able to move forward. And that's what led to him um, a few weeks later submitting his formal letter to uh, CHTC saying that they they didn't want to move forward. And you know, I think if you if you have any question about the efficacy of the um, interpretation that is being lent, you can go back and look at the the select board meetings, uh, the the one where the first presentation took place, and then the one last evening, and and those are happily <coughs> public documents that can right. be observed by anybody on the committee who wishes to. At, at a minimum, I'd encourage everyone. It's in the select board package from last night to read his his letter to CHTC. Um, indicating the reasons for his withdrawal. I, 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 think it's a, I think it's important to know. I do too. I, I had problems getting to the mm -hmm. documents themselves last night. So, but I was up here in New Hampshire where I, where our, the whole process well, was. The, I, I can happy. also email it to you and you can distribute it if you like. I, I would be grateful if you would. And, um, yeah, and maybe Diane, you can send it to all of us. I'd be happy to John. It would be very helpful. Um, that, that was my question was, I just wanted to clarify that the additional million was all um, from the housing trust, not any yes. new free cash. Absolutely, Correct. it was a affordable housing trust. Awesome. And they had a meeting in which they discussed all this and, and said, you know, here's the million. And the question was asked, John, do you have to have the approval of the select board for how you use the money? And the answer was no, but guess what? If the state was, the state was requiring, as, correct me, Liz and Lee, if I'm wrong, but the state was requiring not just the money, but the, the, the governing body support of this whole effort going forward. Right. In other words, it needed to be town approval and support. And, yes. and therefore, the town, it couldn't happen because the town said no. So, um, well, three they, people in the town said no. Three people in the town said no. I wouldn't say yes. So I would say that there was overwhelming sentiment in the other direction by those people who were present last evening. Um, Including unanimous support of the planning board. Right. And, you know, all sorts of organizations around town supporting it. So in any case, my friends, um, I think we have a, a, an important meeting on November 1st. Um, and and does, how much time does that give you all? Does that give you, Liz and... Yep, Please. so we, we will amend the application. Can I ask, um, so the project goes from feasibility to um, more permitting and concrete plans to site construction, you know, clearing the site, bringing, doing the septic to actually constructing the units, right? Like, so that's kind of the overall and all of those require money, right? Um, and so right. is there is there guidance for, should should the CHCC ask for more money? You know, I mean, what's a good number for you? It sounds like you have a lot of money, right? So- um, Well, we you may, know. you know, we may have a lot of money. <laughs> we just don't know at this point. So um, I would be yeah, ambitious good. in your request. Okay, yeah, go, for it. go, go for it. We can always bring it down. Okay. Thank go you. For it. Okay, so I think okay. what we'll do is we'll see, you know, if money was not no object, but how could the project really accelerate and then right. what would that funding look like? Because, um, you know, it's really a year between, you know, getting new funding from yeah, town absolutely. meeting. So, um, but at least it would get it going. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. it might be a different number than what was presented tonight. Right, that's right. Okay, fine, thank you. Thank you for that direction. Do I hear, Chair, no, I, I, don't, I don't want to take a vote on this, but can I see some nods in, 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 in Burton? How are you on all this? I can't see your face, so I'm 
feeling a little lost, but are, are I'm, you- I'm sorry. I don't have good lighting on my end. The, you, my view is, is, is as big. We have a big problem to deal with. So uh, I think that um, I, I would encourage the, uh, a, a larger request. Thank you, Burton. I just wanted to, to make sure that every voice was clearly Thank intended. You. Eve. Uh, just a procedural question for the committee. Um, the, <laughs> when we, um, this application, does the application go away and come back a different application or how do applications get amended after they were submitted? Because I thought in a previous application, we weren't allowed to do that. And now I'm confused. How does well, this work? The only reason this one can be, Eve, um, and and in our very first meeting, I think you were there, but I don't know that you were. In our very first meeting of the of the fall, uh, we acknowledged that there was a possibility of the need for additional money for affordable housing. And it all depended on how this was adjudicated. And the way that can, can happen, and I've been well schooled in this by the, the people like Gary Clayton, um, who was one of the original, and, and Keith Bergman, some of the original progenitors of this particular CPC committee in town. Um, uh, there is a statement that says, after, an ap- after the application deadline, where there is unexpected and urgent need on the part of the town for funding, it may be submitted, um, even though it's late. And so this is really a kind of amended uh, late uh, addition to the application they've presented. So they've got their they've got their toe in the door, and what we're inviting is a whole leg in the door. Um, and and you know we'll have to we'll, we'll have should to we fashion it as get. a supplement to our original is, application? I think so. Right. Yes, absolutely. Eve, does that make sense to you? Yes, I, I guess what you're saying is this is an anticipated special special request, special occasion. Well, it was unhappily anticipated. I again, just listening to all the discussions this summer and listening to everything that the, the, the kind of sentiment and mood, it struck me that we could be in this situation. And alas and alack, as of Monday night, we were. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I, I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't a surprise to us when this happened, if it happened. Uh, because I, I think it required some some careful advanced thinking. It is obviously an exception. I mean, it's not something we normally do. And and I wish Nancy were still with us because Nancy would be the first to say, this is not how we usually do it. Um, and it, it isn't. I mean, I, and but we're not breaking um, we're not breaking any rules in doing so. In other words, we're cleaving to that word can be used both ways, but in the sense of attaching ourselves to, you know, we're cleaving to um, the original language of the of the operation. Andrew. Sorry, I just had one. Um, no, there's no sorry. I, I guess it's a preemptive question for your application. Um, it, it, when you reference that it'll move faster if there's more money available, it might be useful if you can quantify whether the increased in expense is, you know, it, it sounds funny. If You can always speed up construction if you pay more. And the question is, where's the balance of we're speeding it up because we don't have to keep going back and dipping for more versus we're literally throwing money at this problem. And there's a fine line that you may need to figure out when you're swinging for the fences. Right. So That's I just, you know, do you, you understand what I mean when I say that? It's that it's not just... We can have them done tomorrow if we, you know, we get this 1.2 million or whatever it is you end up asking for. But it's we can shave three years because we're not doing four funding cycles, kind of thing. Yeah, um, exactly. it would just be useful to be able to differentiate that. Andrew, that, is, that is beautifully put. Thank you so much. Okay, um, is there another item? Thank you, Lee, and thank you, Liz. Uh, I just I want on behalf of CHTC I, I want to thank your committee for your time and your your support and uh, sympathy <laughs> with respect to the Junction Village Christopher Heights and um, we look forward to working closely with you so I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, okay. okay. Oh, nice. Nice. Thank you. Um, 
I, I, I can't pull up the agenda because I gave away my auxiliary screen when a phone call came in on it from, from our little granddaughter's father. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's just meeting minutes, Diane. It's just meeting minutes. Um, yeah. Given the hour, 9.44, um, perhaps we can put that off until our next meeting, at which point we'll be looking at this issue. We'll be looking at an issue that has been put off for next time already. And then thirdly, we'll be looking at uh, to hear what Delia has to say, you know, as she as she deliberates. So those will be three major items. I'd also like to say that Anne has been doing a lot of cleanup work on documents um, that that uh, uh, lots of them. And so she will be sending out connections with those documents. Paul, this is in direct reaction to the question that you put that I was mired in so much I couldn't get to. but. Um, we will be looking at those at, at those things and voting on those changes um, at our next meeting. So it'll be a busy meeting, but it's going to require a different kind of homework on the part of the committee, which is to read those documents over and see what questions we have. Um, and I really want to comment on because it's, it's she's doing it so so thoughtfully and really fine work um, in reviewing these documents and getting them up to up to speed. So Anne, can we see your face and give you a little round of applause here because it's it's really, you know, very much appreciated yeah it's hard work and you've done it yeah. so beautifully sarah um i just wanted to ask about the friends of kennedy's pond i may have missed a, a statement at some point but has that one been withdrawn then we don't know yet and that's for i have first of all I have to respond to the letter then okay we, then okay. we have to be doing some discussion, but other okay. It, so we'll talk some more about that one. Then. We're going to have okay. to talk some more about it, and that Thank that you. all that all unfortunately rests with the tragedy that I've been dealing with. So, you know, yeah. just, I just didn't have the time to do what I would normally have done thoughtfully. Would it would it be on the agenda next meeting? I think we'll be deciding whether it's on the agenda or not next meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, but we 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 would need to do it in a deliberative way, John. It can't just be a decision made by a couple of people offline. I mean, we're all going to have to, um, you know, it's going to have to be some good discussion, okay? I, I yeah. do think the, the applicant is planning on presenting, was invited to present on, yes. on the first, yeah. That's what I think. Um, oh, so okay, I, good, right. So that's that's all going to be part of things. So I, I want to see whether Dee, or maybe hello Dee, whether she or Linda have anything more to say about what we've done tonight or the cases that we've used. That can inform us. D. Hi, good evening. Um, I just wanted to thank the good discussion that you had this evening. The next uh, finance committee meeting will be held on October 27th, and I will bring to their attention the, definitely the Warner Pond issue, as well as the CHDC request. Um, this is, these are two areas that we have, we are always following. Um, and the, the last thing I just wanted to know, and, and maybe Diane, this would be on your plate. I have no idea if the CPC can um, submit a request to be on, an article on special town meeting. Oh. But if the urgency is required, you may want to investigate that to see wow. if the CPC could have an article what presented a, at special town what meeting. What a January. brilliant, brilliant idea. It's now a short timeline though, isn't it? I mean- It's a very short yeah. timeline. It's gonna be in January. Special town meeting will be in January. And the so warrant you would closes have to have on all what? your ducks. You would have to have all your ducks in order. When does the warrant after? close? Again, I don't have those documents with me. I don't, I don't have that in front of me. Oh, uh, hang on a sec. I've got the, the website. Calendar, it, it calendar, closed, yeah, it closes on the 28th of October yeah. at 1230. It's soon. 1230 on the 28th of October. The calendar closes? The, the warrant. warrant. The warrant. The warrant closes? And, and it opened on the 17th, which was um, yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you don't have enough time if you're not going to if you forget that. <laughs> I don't think you're going to have enough time because well, you won't we could, we could really call know and make up the CPC 
D. Um, and we could we could call an emergency meeting of the CPC quickly. If um, you can, to if you can get all those books in order, then maybe that could work the for you. The purpose would be to make available the Christopher Heights funding is what D right. is suggesting, and make right. that Christopher Heights funding available to us in this um, in this year of giving right. grants. And, and then that would then allow us to consider that funding. Um, now, it wouldn't happen until January. Uh, you know what the problem with this, D? It's really smart of you, but but we, we already have to have our warrant in before that, that special town meeting. We have to have everything in. Now, we could put a placeholder in the warrant and, and say that we would be, in, in terms of our actually CPC application, it would have to be, we, we already- you you may want to just research it to see if you okay. can do it. There might be legal but, ramifications. You might have to have a number not to exceed so much money, that sort of thing. Um, the other the other way you could do it, and I'm not sure you'd have to check on this too in terms of how you could make the funds piece. available, would be you can always set aside funds yeah. for um, affordable housing. You know, of the yeah. of the money that you have remaining that hasn't been committed or a portion that hasn't been committed, you can always put that aside and you could put that aside in affordable housing. I'm not sure how at what time set can be accessed. So that would be another. That's, yeah, that's another question. whole question. Well, we, we will we will dive yeah. in. Thank you for your imagination and creativity. As a former chair for the- Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dee has been a former chair of the CPC and, and, and she has admirably struggled with these questions in the past. Um, thank well, you. you have some real challenges in front of you and I really applaud the questions that you're asking yeah. and really detailed questions and really um, important questions that you're asking. So I, I appreciate listening to your conversations. Let's Thank see. you. It's really an exquisite committee, actually. Um, Linda Escobedo, anything, any commentary you'd like to offer before we say goodnight? No, I think you've covered it all. I, um, you know, I think um, an initial conversation with the town manager immediately about okay. the po possibility, so that you don't, yeah, is yeah. in order. Yeah, I will. I will try to speak with her tomorrow. Thank you so much, Linda. Yeah. Thank you. Diane, I was it's Lawrence, just uh, Burton, sorry, just chiming in. Um, it seems to me that that would be a very simple motion, right? To just essentially uh, provide that the that the million dollars previously previously allocated is 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 reclaimed and and re preserved for affordable housing, which would if that ha when when would we when do we need to publish our warrant for the regular town meeting? Again, I don't have that document with me, Burton. I'm sorry. Because, because I was going to say, as long as that is after uh, the special town meeting, it would seem that we could bring that funding into the allocation we do at the regular town meeting. That Let's makes see. Sense. Um, I think I may be able to figure that out. The um, the warrant closes on January sixth. For the for the regular for the, town meeting. For the regular town meeting. And the special town meeting, Linda, again, you said was what it's date? Twenty eighth of October. Um, but no, the, that's when the warrant closes. When, when is the actual special oh, town the, meeting? The, the, the special town meeting is going to be January nineteenth, I think. Seventeenth, I think maybe. Seventeenth. Oh, yeah. okay. So we couldn't put that money 19th, in. Nineteenth is correct. Oh, sorry. sorry. Anyway, um, it, you know, so we couldn't really put it to use, Burton, is what I was figuring out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was hoping that we could somehow yeah. reclaim that money in time to put it. Then reallocate it more, I know. you know, more thoughtfully in time. For, okay. Yeah, but the problem is we, we, we can do it. I, I don't know. Has anybody ever done it theoretically? <laughs> theoretically, believing we're going to get that million dollars back, should we? <laughs> I, I think that may be stretching our. <laughs> so, well, so so then then I guess the, then the question would be whether we can just go ahead and 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 alloc and allocate it like to the the C C D C H D C. As, as absent a specific detailed project. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it's. This is an interesting question, Burton. Let's confer closely over the next um, five days. Um, you know, between you and me, 
uh, and Carrie and see what we can figure out, okay? Will do. Okay, sounds like a plan. You guys are great, thank you. Um, do I hear at 10 o'clock, um, three hours of deliberation, a motion to a, a, a adjourn and we'll do a lot of good hearty paperwork at the next one. <laughs> um, I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Sarah. Do I see a second? Thank you, Paul. Um, is a second. Charles? I or Nate? Aye. Aye. Aye, John? Yes, sir. I think that was a yes from John. Yes. Yeah. Andrew um, and Paul, yeah. you're a yes. Okay. And Nancy's leaving the room. No. <laughs> is, this about, is this about to adjourn? Yes. 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 I'm back. Oh, God. What, a, what a night over here. Yeah, I know. And Britain, you're all set. Yes. You need to talk to Mike tomorrow. Okay, yes, absolutely. Well, listen, thank you all so much. Um, and we'll continue our creativity. <laughs> Thanks, Dan, for letting me thank back you. in. Okay. Bye, guys. Good night. Good night.